Good morning, everyone. <laughs> we are really delighted to have you all here. I hope everybody was able to get in without any difficulty. Um, and I want to just cover a few logistics before we get started today. Um, the first is if you could please turn off your cell phones. Um, remember, this will be starting at 8.30. We're going to be doing this as a live webinar. So people will be able to hear you on your cell phone <laughs> from everywhere. So please turn off your cell phones. In addition, because we will be doing this with a webinar, when you have a question, there's microphone in the back or use the microphone for the faculty champions that are sitting at the table, please press the button. The red light will turn on. Please make sure you use the microphones whenever you have a question or part of the discussion. And then when you're done, just push the button to turn the microphone off. A um, couple uh, additional issues, we will be accepting questions from the webinar participants. So in addition to you all who are our priority group, if there's time, then we'll be also having our speakers answer questions that will be coming through the computer system. Um, and then uh, Eileen Castiglia on the side there is our uh, conference coordinator extraordinaire. And if you have any questions about logistics, um, Please feel free to talk with Eileen. The restrooms are back down the corridor and turn left as if you're going back to the elevator. Um, and so hopefully that'll take care of most of um, the logistics, if anything. Is there any sort of logistic question that people have before we get started? Well, good. <laughs> All right, so I want to uh, first start out with introducing uh, the person who's sort of the co-chair with this with me, who's Dr. Jean Jenkins here at the front. Um, we tried to get around the room to introduce ourselves to everybody, but we may have missed a few people as you've come in. Um, and Jeannie is an extraordinary traveler in addition to everything else, so hence our little travel pictures. And then, of course, I'm Kathy Calzone. Um, and so we have been working together to uh, move forward uh, genetic and genomic competency for all nurses. Um, and clearly, we see that the faculty is sort of that vital role of all of this, of preparing the new nurses that are coming into the fold. So what do we mean by faculty champion? We're calling you faculty champions. And what exactly is that? Um, we think of that as people who are really passionate for a new idea and within your school are going to be able to lead and teach others and are going to be able to put the energy into this initiative to move some of this forward for your school. That's one of the reasons why this was a competitive application and one of the reasons why we're really looking at that year-long commitment. This is not the kind of thing that you can go home and be done with overnight. Um, they're like the gatekeeper, the person that people can go to within the school. Um, and we know that uh, champions who are effective are able to accelerate how long it would take to take an innovation and move it into either practice or education. And that's why we've chosen to sort of take that approach. So why do we want to do that? It's that acceleration. Um, I think when Dr. Guttmacher comes to speak to us this morning to deliver our keynote address, um, it's a testament to how rapidly this is moving out and can move into practice. And so we need to be able to respond to that. You know, nurses are in every setting. I certainly don't need to tell you all of that um, and are being confronted with that every day. And so as a consequence, we need to be able to think about how quickly we can respond to these issues. So who are the people who are here today? We appreciate everyone completing the survey. You know, it's very helpful for us in terms of planning our year's worth of activities. We are really going to be relying on you to guide us on how we move forward and what we're going to do. And clearly, we think that um, understanding what your needs are and being able to respond to what you need to move this forward within your school is going to be the most effective approach. Um, and so we wanted to know whether you thought that this was important. And clearly, most people think that this is important. Um, 
and that the majority of you are at a point where you're going to be adopting curriculum changes within the next six months. Um, there are some people who are, um, goodness me, going to do it in less than 30 days. And there are a few people who have actually done this already. Um, and so that's a good compliment because you are a group that would be working together and would be able to uh, learn from each other's experiences. But um, you're all pretty much in the same boat, <laughs> um, not uh, uh, any one group standing out above the others. Um, most people feel that there is are changes that they can make to their curriculum to make room for genetics and genomics and part of what we're going to do today is to actually cover some of that and from some of our faculty exemplars um, that we have brought in here to share their expertise with you. Um, we were really interested in seeing what are the barriers because those are the kinds of things that we're going to try to help address. Um, and so clearly there are four things that stood out. Um, and one is NCLEX. Um, we are unlikely to influence that process. Um, that it's not a high enough priority, and we certainly appreciate that. There are a wide variety of priorities of what do we teach our students and how do we do that, and um, how do we balance um, what's really the most important, and we appreciate that. Um, and so we're looking at strategies that can help you do this so that it's not so burdensome. Um, and the curriculum is too full, we know that already. Um, and that's why we've brought in people to guide some of this to assist you in how you could think about doing this a little differently. And that the faculty are not knowledgeable. Um, we were not surprised by that, but it is a good validation of what we thought, is that people don't feel they have a command of that material. Um, this program today is not going to give you all of that information. Our intent is to set a platform of which to build over the next year and to provide you with a framework of strategies that you can use to move this forward. Um, and, and we know that none of us are uh, genetic and genomic experts. And I'm always afraid if I go over, start talking to the scientists, I might get some science on my shoes. So, um, you know, uh, we're going to be all working together to figure out, you know, what exactly is it that people need to know? We don't feel that you need to be genetic and genomic experts, but what exactly is it that you need to know to be able to effectively teach your students? Um, we did ask you what was it that you had done so far, and um, informal chats and discussions seems to be the most predominant thing. There are a number of people who haven't done anything, and uh, we're delighted actually with that because that's one of the strategies that we're really interested in, giving you ideas and resources and materials and support throughout the year of things that you could do. Um, so we're actually pleased that our application process worked and we got uh, a good group of people of that haven't done everything they needed to do. So what are the expectations? Uh, Jean Jenkins will cover all of that in detail, far more detail um, as we go throughout the day and towards the end of the day. But I'll just give you a framework of what we're really expecting um, from you over the next year. This is a year-long commitment. Um, we will have periods in which we will be doing some survey work um, and trying to keep them as short as possible um, using the same online survey methodology to gain some information about what kinds of things we can best do to help you. Um, we will have periodic conference calls. We will be relying on you to guide the frequency and structure of those. Um, we will likely do some of that through an online technology where you can log in and be able to see documents or resources or anything that we decide to use those conference calls for. Um, we will be asking you to submit brief quarterly reports of what kinds of things you've done. We want to be able to see whether this is effective. If it isn't effective, there's no reason to continue it. If it is something that's working and the schools have found it valuable and your colleagues have found it valuable and helpful, then it's something you know we would like to potentially uh, obtain more funds to get. And then at the end, we will have another meeting like this, um, which will actually be less of us talking at you and more of you talking at us um, next year, September of 2010. Um, and then we will sort of wrap up with another survey. Um, the kinds of things we're looking at, 
from you are things like uh, really taking the time to evaluate your curriculum, to share your expertise with your colleagues at the table, um, and begin to interface with some of our faculty exemplars of people who have done this, some of whom are here. And in addition, uh, we're working on setting up additional resources of people who you can engage with. Um, we want you to share the things that you've done, share resources you have. By no means do we have all of the resources or answers here. Uh, we're uh, expecting everyone to be able to contribute to this. Um, and to also provide us with input about opportunities that we haven't considered of things that would be useful to you to move things forward. So where are all of you in terms of your knowledge? Um, I certainly had a few emails from some people of expressing a little bit of concern about this. And I think we're where we all expected, that people are either in the low to moderate category of how much they know about genetics and genomics. Some people are saying, well, not very much at all. And, and there are a few people saying they have quite a bit of knowledge. Um, so I think the majority of people are where they expected, not knowing everything, feeling they have a little bit of a handle, but not enough. And the only thing that I would challenge you to say is that, you know, I certainly, when I started in genetics, remembered through the uh, cobwebs in my brain something about Gregor Mendel and his peas. And, um, but I would actually challenge you to think about the fact that you probably are either a, know more than you think you do, or B, teaching more than you think you are. Because I've actually never met a nurse who doesn't understand sickle cell and recessive transmission. And that is genetics. You may not think of it as genetics when you're evaluating your curriculum, but in actual fact it is, right? And so we want you to begin to think about what are things that you may be doing that are actually teaching some of this material that you may not actually appreciate. And what actually is it do you know? You probably know more than you think you do. Um, and so we, you know, just like you to sort of think about that as you go through the day. Um, so what are we going to do today? Uh, we are not going to be able to give you uh, Genetics 101 in one day. Um, that's not possible and that's not our intent. Our intent is to set a platform for work that we're going to continue throughout the year. We will give you an overview of some of what's going on in genetics and genomics that has clinical relevance. And the acting director of the National Human Genome Research Institute is doing that lecture for us, Dr. Guttmacher, and I think that's a testament to how important it is that the director of the Genome Institute would come and speak to this forum, um, that how important it is for educators to translate this uh, to their students and move this forward. Um, we will be talking a little bit about the competencies, which you all received a copy of with your syllabus when you checked in this morning. And if you haven't, there are more copies in the back with Eileen. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the baccalaureate essentials, which are the, some of the content that was integrated into that came from the competencies. Um, we have wonderful experts who are going to talk to you about strategies to evaluate your curriculum and models for curriculum integration. What works for one school is not going to work for others. And to give you a flavor of that, we have people sitting at the table who graduate 10 entry-level nursing students per year and schools at the table that graduate more than 300 nursing students per year at the entry level. So we have.
Hi, I'm Trish Brennan. I'm from San Ramon Merritt University, which is in Oakland, California, outside of San Francisco. Um, and we have um, four campuses throughout the state. Uh, so we actually graduate quite a few um, entry-level nursing students. I'm new to the faculty, um, and I had the opportunity to present a genetics lecture to the faculty in the spring. And again, everyone was very excited but had no idea how relevant it would be to any of their classes. So um, I, too, am looking for some strategies from the experts, the people that have done this before. But I'm also looking to help develop relationships with you because I think this year is going to be a trajectory where we'll learn from each other and hopefully be successful as a group. Hi, I'm Pat Henry. I'm from Indiana University, South Bend. Um, I need, I need two things. I need buy-in from the faculty, and I need more knowledge. And I'm hoping today to find out what, how much is enough. I mean, how, exactly how far do we need to go? But anyway, that's. I'm Luann Martin. I'm from Lawrence, Kansas. I teach for Baker University School of Nursing. It's a small Methodist school in northeastern Kansas. And um, I, I teach pathophysiology, so I probably have the bulk right now of genetics in our curriculum. I know as it comes up, and especially clinically, that they address those issues. But we are in the middle of uh, curriculum revision based on the uh, new essentials and have a visit in 2010. So faculty are, yes, resistive, but no, they have to. And so they're willing, um, but uh, we need some direction and leadership, so that's why I'm here. Hello, my name is Mary Brakey. I'm from the University of Maine School of Nursing in Orono. And I would, um, I do teach some genetics in my oncology content, but it is not a major thread in the curriculum at this time. But as you said uh, earlier that uh, we do teach sickle cell, and so maybe we teach more than we really think. But we've had some major threads lately, such pain management, terminal illness, and so this is one more thread, and I would need to know how to integrate it without making everyone all discouraged about doing it in a high workload. So some maybe moderate formulas for integrating the content would be good. I'm Mary Diaz, and I'm from the University of Texas Pan American. And um, I, in in the faculty where I work, there is a lot of resistance to change. Period. So I believe that I need help with strategies and maybe a model that could be something that could be introduced, um, and so that I wouldn't have the resistance from the faculty that seems to exist. We're just kind of comfortable, you know, where we are. So that's difficult to, to get things changed. Good morning. I'm Tara O'Brien. I'm from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Um, I need strategies and resources. Um, I feel that our faculty, um, that um, they're actually excited about me being here today and having the opportunity to learn about um, genetics and genomics. Um, but they, um, they need me to be the resource for them to figure out how they can integrate this information um, into our curriculum. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Chismark. I go by Lisa. And I am new faculty at Clemson University. Uh, Clemson University has totally embraced uh, genomics and uh, genetics into their curriculum. And in the spring of 2011, uh, this year's freshman catalog will be taking uh, a, ma a mandatory uh, healthcare genetics course. So I need help in how um, we're going to form that class. What is the best method? Best method for delivering that information within this class and uh, textbook um, evaluation and how we're going to uh, work that in. Good morning. I'm Kim Sebasic. I'm from the University of Scranton in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, my, we're not anywhere where you are. <laughs> um, I, I'm here interested to um, learn about how to integrate curriculum changes, um, possibly more a model suggestions where we can 
put in pieces of genetics or genomics. Um, as previously mentioned, I'm sure it's happening, but I don't know that the awareness is associated with that. So um, I, I, I think that's my primary piece at this point. Good morning. Um, I'm Diane Van Ah. I'm from Indiana University at Indianapolis campus, um, and we consist of Indiana University. The corridor schools are Bloomington, Indianapolis, and Columbus. So um, our challenge will be things that when we go to implement genetics and integrate it in the curriculum, um, we might be looked at from the other schools as well as how will we be doing it, how will they do it. Um, so we, we'll, we will try to share some resources. There's been some talk of initially integrating it, but also then developing a uh, separate course that I would develop, um, something that would maybe be leveled across uh, degrees from a one credit hour to um, more of a graduate. So trying to figure out the levels, uh, what the generalist needs, what the master's prepared nurse needs um, is something that hopefully we can, you know, figure out a little bit better too. So um, we have a lot of needs. Um, I'm Jenny Malloy. I'm, um, faculty undergrad in the undergraduate uh, college of nursing at university of south florida um, and i was um, i teach women's health i'm lead faculty for women's health and so i'm the only one that lectures on genetics right now or thinks that they lecture on genetics and genomics <laughs> so i i got invited to uh, attend the national functional genomics summit um, last year and i'm going to be going back again this year it's in october in uh, in san key um, and so, therefore, I became the expert in genetics genomics. <laughs> um, I'm on the curriculum committee, so I wrote a curriculum. Um, I did a concept map for how we can integrate uh, genetics into our curriculum. Currently, I believe that we're probably, um, I ordered a textbook. I have um, I need resources. I can't really find a nice nursing textbook. I found a medical textbook. What uh, the textbook rep said was, um, that's way too hard for your nursing students. That's for doctors. So I said, well, how about you let me look at it anyway? And I think maybe we can maybe we can work with that. Um, so I need we need textbooks. Um, I need to get the faculty on board. Um, we we haven't we we as in I'm the only one that's really talking about it. But um, we don't have a um, we haven't thought about doing a course. Um, I know that's maybe one of the options, but I think it's easier since most uh, colleges of nursing are so content heavy anyway to thread it through the curriculum. Um, so that's that's what I'm working on. I've written an objective, an outcomes-based objective for all the courses so that uh, we can meet the essentials. I'm Karen Witt, and I am from George Washington University. And we're in a perfect position right now to integrate genetics in our curriculum because our program is brand new because we just started our BSN program this fall. So I'm in the process of, of developing um, many of the courses that will be coming up. Unfortunately, I, we didn't know about this meeting, and, and so we some of the information would have been applicable to our first courses that are being taught now. But since then, I've been trying to give um, some of the faculty information to put in their courses as we go along. Um, I think what I need the most right now is um, resources to make the information applicable to the clinical setting and really practical for the faculty and the students to understand this material and how to apply it to their patient care. And that's what I'm looking for in this. And then I'd also want resources to be able to teach um, the faculty to be more knowledgeable in this area. I'm Barbara Owens. Can you hear me? Works. Okay. Um, Pull the I'm mic from the University you. of Texas Health Science Center. Is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm short. I'm down here. Um, <laughs> and we are. Uh, rolling out a new curriculum. So uh, likewise from the two people before me, um, and I am um, on the, the chair of the traditional track. We also have the accelerated track, which I just found out as I was walking over here this morning. They expect me there at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning to um, tell them things. I, I don't even know what, but I guess to share this. <laughs> uh, so I'll try to get home at 1 and be there at 9. Um, so anyway, we have used the AAC and Essentials and threaded 
genomics through the curriculum, but we definitely are. We're right in the phase of, of strategies and resources to apply. So ditto from what both of those people said. Thank you. I'm Chris Kurtz. I'm from Valparaiso University in Valparaiso, Indiana. Um, we have minimal genetics and genomics content. Every instructor, I think, is kind of doing their own thing. We've done none of those things in terms of talking about them, having work, workshops, brown bag lunches, nothing. Um, and I've heard some positive comments from faculty. Oh, I'm so excited you're doing this. That'll be great, you know, a great thing to add. So I don't anticipate a ton of resistance, but we really need knowledge. I think we just don't really know what is important to include and the best ways to do that. Hi, I'm Phyllis Moore from Bloomfield College, Bloomfield, New Jersey, and I feel that we're almost in the same position that Chris is. Uh, I think that there's openness, willingness on the part of faculty and appreciation of the essentials expectation and very little knowledge as to what needs to get into the curriculum. I think once we can get a handle on the what, we can probably figure out the how. Um, but the what to me is somewhat of a mystery. So we need clear outcomes that we will achieve within the um, program or that students will achieve within the program. And then I think resources, materials to help us integrate into the curriculum. Hi, I'm Kathleen Shedlock. I'm from Upstate Medical University uh, in New York, which is really in the middle of New York State. but. If you live in New York State, anything north of the Tappan Zee is upstate New York. Um, but I am relatively new to the faculty. Um, I have some experience in genomics, uh, having been a medical liaison for uh, Oncotype DX. So I think that the faculty is, you know, very willing and understanding the importance of integrating this into the curriculum. But I think what I need to bring back to them is a sense of what, you know, in terms of there's so much information, so understanding what are the key things in terms of our curriculum and then how to do that. I think that, you know, is it integrating it as threads or separate courses or both? So uh, that's, I think, what the faculty is, you know, really eager to have some uh, guidance about. Thanks. I'm going to be a, a bad person here and that I'm the timekeeper for the day. So I need to move you just a little bit quicker so that we can get to Dr. Guttmacher and maybe we'll have the opportunity to have you guys talk a little bit more at the break, perhaps. I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. I'm Wendy Blakely. I am from Capital University at Columbus, uh, Columbus, Ohio. And I'm new this year, so I'm on the steep end of the learning curve there, just learning what the faculty resources and expertise is there. Um, but I get the sense that um, they are certainly accepting of the fact that it's an important thing to include in the curriculum um, and they're fine with me teaching it. Um, that's kind of one of the reasons I, I, that they probably hired me, but I think there's more, more anxiety if they have to teach it, so kind of helping other faculty if they have to integrate it into their course courses and also if if what if it takes away from what they're currently teaching I think that's probably also anxiety so knowing is essentially what we do need to include and what's most important and in increasing faculty comfort level I'm Barbara White I'm the Dean for nursing at Colorado Christian University and we don't have a program yet I don't have students I don't have faculty <laughs> we are <laughs> going through the state board approval process. We've designed our curriculum with our healthcare partners. And of course, their emphasis is CUSE and data from day one. And so our new curriculum will have that as a thread. Um, we do plan to have a course in genetics um, and genomics for um, pre-nursing students and then to integrate it. So I need resources and um, I'll hopefully I'll be able to um, be a champion for the faculty that I don't have yet. <laughs> Thank you. My name's Carrie Merkel. I'm with the University of Arizona in Tucson, and I am most interested in strategies to integrate uh, genetics into a program that is just jam-packed with content. Hi, I'm uh, Sister Kathy Burton. I'm from Mount Marty College in Yankton, South Dakota. And that is exactly what I was going to say, just strategies. Um, our curriculum just seems so busy already, so how can we integrate this in, um, kind of streamline it, so. 
Hi, I'm Kathy McGuinn. I'm Director of Special Projects at the American Association of the Colleges of Nursing. So one of my very special projects was working on the baccalaureate essentials. So I'm delighted to be here with you this morning and learn all about what you're going to do. Uh, we recognize that there's a real urgent need for faculty development related to this area. And I've had the pleasure of working with Kathy and Jean for about four years now. So we've had a good time trying to get to this point and we're looking forward to today. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, welcome again to the National Institutes of Health and we hope that this will be a productive year. Um, so I'll just make a couple comments for webinar participants because we'll get going with our program. And that is that we will be prioritizing questions from the audience from our faculty champions in the room, but we will accept questions from webinar participants. The chat box will be on the corner of your screen and you just need to type in your question and then uh, if time allows we will be able to give it to our speaker. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Alan Guttmacher, and uh, we are delighted with his busy schedule that he could find the time to come and speak to you. He is uh, received his AB degree from Harvard College and his MD from Harvard Medical School. Um, Dr. Guttmacher was the director of the Vermont Regional uh, Genetic Center at the University of Vermont, where he started their uh, cancer genetics uh, familial cancer program, their newborn screening program, and uh, worked with their intensive care unit and an NIH-supported uh, initiative and their uh, first statewide initiative on the ethical, legal, and social implications of genetics and genomics. Um, Dr. Guttmacher has joined the NIH here and uh, worked with the National Human Genome Research Institute initially as the senior clinical advisor to the director and currently is the acting director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. And so we are delighted that he was able to join us today. Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and I'd like, I guess, on behalf of the National Human Genome Research Institute to welcome you to NIH. We're so happy you're doing this this year. Uh, essentially, what my talks I think really going to be about in some ways is we did the easy stuff that is sequencing the human genome. You've got the hard work in front of you, which is changing curricula, which is obviously <laughs> much, much more difficult to do. Uh, and much more complex, et cetera, et cetera. It was very interesting to hear the short intros around the table, what you want to get out of here, what you, some of the challenges you face, and I don't think they're surprising. As a matter of fact, I was a little surprised by some of you that seem to think that uh, you have some, uh, you know, some uh, folks out there who are glad you're here and looking forward to this, et cetera, because uh, any kind of change of curriculum is difficult. I think this kind of change is particularly daunting because I think maybe in recent years we've entered an era where people can get the idea, well, yeah, this genetics, genomic stuff, somehow it's important, which is different from a few years ago when people just sort of said, go away, why are you bothering us? Uh, but most people still don't realize, well, why is it important? How might I actually use this in day-to-day -day healthcare? And what I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a window into is what are some of the cutting-edge research things that are going on in genetics and genomics, but particularly what might that look like in terms of healthcare? Where are we going with this? Why is it important? How might we actually use it in a way to change the way uh, we interact with patients? So I'm going to contrast, I'm going to create a little bit of an artificial construct, but I think an uh, important sort of teaching one, the difference between what I'm going to call genetic health care and genomic health care, because I'm going to use the term genetics pretty consistently, I hope, as opposed to genomics. I'm going to use genetics to refer to single genes and what they do. So I'm a medical geneticist by training as well as a pediatrician, so basically what I did for many years in terms of seeing patients was to pe see people with single gene disorders, so-called Mendelian disorders, of whom there are many. Uh, since, you know, this is the NIH, we're supposed to be erudite and quote the literature to you, I did bring you something from the literature. This is from my years when I was a, a clinician in Vermont. You'll see it from my favorite journal. Uh, the Weekly World News, creature captured live in Vermont, bat with a human face, he's smart as a whip, says stunned scientist. This is the way many people think about genetics in healthcare. That genetics refers usually to the child with the 
the uh, undiagnosed uh, kind of combination of funny physical findings, and you refer that uh, kid to someone like me, the medical geneticist, sort of Sherlock Holmes with a stethoscope, and we see the child. We do, of course, a family history as well as a history of physical, et cetera, and then send the child back to their primary care provider with some kind of uh, triple eponymous, whatever it is, uh, eponym name, uh, and tell them about the four other cases in the world's literature, and that's been kind of the use of genetics in healthcare to a lot of people. Now, of course, for families and individuals who have a single gene disorder, the genetic nature of their health is incredibly important, but there aren't that many kids and families out there. Genomic healthcare is very different, and that's why it becomes so important to get it into curricula because genomic healthcare refers to our entire human genome. All of those genes we have, all those 20,000, 21,000 genes that we all have, how they interact together, and very importantly, how they in interact with non-genetic factors and environmental factors to basically create health and disease. It's much more complex, but it gets to the, qu the care of patients every day because genomic health care tells us things, for instance, about these disorders. These are the ten leading causes of death in the U.S. for 2004. Every year it's pretty much the same. Uh, number ten sometimes changes, but, uh, but it's pretty much the same. And what I would say is in common for all of these is that for years we've known, gee, genetics plays some kind of a role. If you have a family history, you have an increased risk of developing the disorder yourself. But that was about all we were able to say. In recent years, though, that has changed dramatically. We're in an era where we're going from being able to say just, well, gee, if there's a family history of this, be concerned, to actually being beginning to identify the specific genetic factor that's responsible for that increased risk and based upon that make interventions that's actually going to change the health and well-being of our patients. The one on that list that gets a question mark rather than just being listed is injury because many people would say, well, gee, what does genetics have with injury? Injury is a kind of fluke thing, et cetera. Of course, injury is not a fluke thing at all. Uh, it doesn't deserve a question mark, uh, though many people would say, gee, that can't be genetic. I would argue that every disease, injury, et cetera, we know genetics plays a role, just a role. It doesn't predict completely what's going to happen, but it plays a role, even with injury. In fact, there's a genetic factor that's been identified a long time ago, and some of you have seen me use this slide before and make this point. This may be the first time just about that I've made this point to this kind of room, because usually what I say is, in fact, there's been a genetic factor that's been identified a long time ago that on cursory physical examination, you can, with a fair degree of certainty in most populations, make the diagnosis of whether somebody has this genetic variant, which, if they have it, places them at a much greater risk for developing injury and, in fact, dying from it. That genetic factor, I usually say, well, I'm going to tell several of you in the room, just looking around the room, that you have this variant, and I'm going to do that without a proper uh, informed consent, et cetera. And that genetic variant, of course, is something known as the Y chromosome. In this room, I would appear to be the only one who is at increased <laughs> risk for dying of injury. Uh, because if you have the Y chromosome, as my wife says, it does nothing much helpful for you, but it does make you a male. Uh, in doing that, it makes you at a much higher risk for dying of injury. Now, perhaps that's sociocultural, though I'd ask you to tell me about some culture where this is not the, the truth, uh, so it gets only a question mark. But there are other biological factors having nothing with the X or Y chromosome that people are beginning to show actually do increase one's risk of developing injury and even dying from it, things that may have something to do with so-called thrill-seeking behaviors and other kinds of things that can have to do with injury. Again, they may have nothing to do with one's gender. But the other point that talking about injury, I think, makes, which is an important one, we usually think about genetic factors as risk factors for developing a disease, and they play a huge role there. Depends upon the disease how large, but they play a role. But they also play a very important role in how we react to the disease or the injury once we develop it. In fact, even for injury, if you get a couple of different people with the same injury, the question of who goes on to develop ARDS and needs to be, you know, resp becomes respirator dependent, for instance, versus somebody else who seems to skate through pretty much unscathed by the same injury. Well, there are lots of things that can affect that, underlying medical status, all kinds of things. But one of them, and again, there's, there's more and more data about this, that one of the things that can affect it is, in fact, your individual genetic makeup, how you respond to whether it's injury or the drugs we use to treat uh, diseases, whatever. Genetics has a lot to do with disease response as well as disease causation. 
Genomic healthcare, of course, is built on this foundation of the Human Genome Project. Uh, since I come from the NHGRI, I have to use this slide. It's in my contract. I have to brag about the fact the Human Genome Project was your typical international governmental project that ended ahead of schedule and under budget, uh, which may just show that we were poor planning things, but we take a lot of pride in those two facts. Uh, and that also, interestingly, from the early days of the Genome Project, earmarked 3 to 5 percent of its funding. It's been 5 percent for many years looking at the so-called LC issues, the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomics. That's been very important to, I think, both the basic research, but also very clearly important to its healthcare applications. Our institute continues to, to devote 5 percent of all of our funding to look at these kinds of things. The Human Genome Project did some other things. Uh, it produced the human genome sequence. That's what it gets most of the attention it's, it, for, of course. It spawned this new field of genomics. It spurred new technologies. And I think importantly now gives us some new tools to be able to use in healthcare. It also, just in terms of research, made some important points. It showed that you could have sort of large, sort of top down managed science, you now biological sciences, and that could still be worthwhile. There was a history of that in physics and some other areas of science, but in the biomedical sciences, there wasn't much of a history. As a matter of fact, there really wasn't any of saying, big projects were important. It was all about hypothesis-driven science. There's no hypothesis to the Human Genome Project unless the hypothesis was we hypothesize that we can sequence the human genome. Most people, in fact, doubted that, that we would be able to do that. But uh, I think we've established that while still uh, much biological research needs to be hypothesis-driven, sometimes projects that develop resources that can empower uh, hypothesis-driven uh, projects are very important. The other thing which the Genome Project did, and I think if people look back 100 or 200 years from now, what was the contribution of the Genome Project? This is going to be its largest contribution. It's not going to be that we sequence the human genome. Eventually, that would have been done anyway. It would have taken a lot longer. It would have been much more disjointed, but it would have happened eventually. The big thing I think we helped do was a cardinal principle of the Genome Project was that every 24 hours, all of the data it was generating was put up on a, ser on a computer server. Anybody else who had a computer and paid their electrical bill could download that data every 24 hours. And that continues to be a fundamental aspect, I think, of the field of genomics, the idea that data does not belong to the principal investigator. It belongs to society, particularly data that's generated based on federal funding, belongs to society. And while we need to come up with good ways to recognize the con contributions of the principal investigators, the researchers who develop the data, in fact, it doesn't exist for their use. It exists for society use. And the more people we can get to see the data and use it as quickly as possible, um, the quicker science will advance and therefore health will. So it's interesting, just the contextual kind of thing. Some of the things that we'll be talking about uh, today and that you all will be dealing with over the next year will seem kind of space agey to some people. They'll say, oh, yeah, it's never going to get here, et cetera. It's an interesting contextual thing to realize that it was only 50 years, um, the lifetime of some of us in this room, uh, that we went from the first description of the double helix of DNA in 1953 to the complete sequencing of the human genome in 2003. And if there's anything we know about science, um, healthcare, et cetera, it is that each year they move more quickly than the year before. So some of the things that we'll talk about that might sound like the kind of futuristic, well, they may be a little futuristic, but they're clearly going to be around in the lives of many of the folks in this room, and clearly of the younger patients we take care of, they will be. I think that what's happened with genetic and genomic technologies is the same thing that's happened with any kind of new technology going all the way back to railroads, the invention of the telegraph, other kinds of things. People have tended to way overestimate the immediate impact and expect, well, gee, you sequenced the human genome April the 14th, 2003. Why wasn't everybody healthier on April the 15th, 2003? Um, so really overestimate what's going to happen immediately, but have underestimated, as is traditionally the case, the middle and long-term impact of these things that really do change the way. Same thing about computers, et cetera. Uh, this is a semantic point, but I think an important one. You'll hear people talk about we are in the post-genome era. 
If there's anything we know about genome eras, it is that we were in the pre-genome era until April the 14th, 2003, when it was announced that the genome had been sequenced. So if we're now in the post-genome era, that would argue that the genome era itself was essentially April the 14th, 2003. If you weren't pay att paying attention that day, you were too busy or something, you missed an incomplete era, apparently, in the history of humanity. You did not. We are just now at the beginning of the genome era. And the students that you teach, they will in some ways be the first generation to really figure out these tools, to apply them to healthcare, et cetera. So one of the pitches I'm going to make to you is, and it's probably true of any kind of, of learning, you need to give, obviously, the students you work with a framework, some basic concepts, but you basically need to engage them to really want to be lifelong learners. If there's any area in healthcare that that's going to be necessary, this is it. Because I really do, A, believe it's going to revolutionize healthcare, but, re but think, B, we don't know that much yet. We know some of the basics. We know some of the framework. But if we go much beyond that, we're going to teach things that are going to be outmoded very quickly. So I think most of what you need to do is to teach, again, some basic essentials and a framework and some real appreciation of how folks will use this in their careers. We faced a, a sort of a challenge as an institute. We were founded basically to lead the, f the federal effort in sequencing the human genome. So as the sequencing came near to an end, we sort of had to think about well, gee, what's next? What are you going to do next? Which caused us, um, some people said you, what you should do is you should be the first federal bureaucracy that said you were founded to do something, you did it. So just, you know, have a big party, go home, and, you know, that's it. So we had a big party. We decided not to go home because we realized oh, it's the beginning of the genome era. Now it gets pretty exciting. So now what we started thinking about is let's understand the way that the genome plays a role in all of these diseases and lots of other ones as well. Well, so we thought about doing that. The sort of frightening part of that was to look at this graph. And this was done in 2002, the same time that we were coming to the end of the, of the genome project. And the good news in this graph is if you look at the pink line, because you get to use the, the numbers over here, you can see that these are so-called human Mendelian traits, basically single gene disorders, things like sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis, et cetera. And it looks pretty good. We, there were, by 2002, there were about 1,700 such disorders for which the gene involved had been identified. So that seemed pretty good. Well, it's not so good when you realize there are five or 6,000 of those disorders. So in fact, even there, we hadn't found the genes involved in most of them. But what was really depressing, because if you think back on that slide about the leading causes of mortality, the same thing if you did morbidity in the United States or worldwide, they're not single gene disorders. They're so-called common complex disorders where genes play a role, but multiple genes are involved, lots of environmental factors. For those, unfortunately, we have to use a scale over here in the blue. So for those, we had only 30. And of course, there are scores of such disorders. There were only 30 for which we knew the genes involved. And it gets even worse than that because that is in all different species in any species. So that includes, you know, mice, rats, apes, whatever you might look at. For humans, it was down here in single figures. So despite the fact that there are scores of common disorders that affect patients and us, uh, we weren't doing very well. The reason was that people were using a so-called candidate gene approach. We would try to guess. I think maybe this gene is involved in this disease. Let's see whether there are variants of this gene in people who have the disease versus those who don't. Well, the human genome is much more complex than our ability to figure it out, so we weren't getting very far. We thought, well, let's use an agnostic approach. What about if we looked across the whole genome? If you took 1,000 people with a disease and 1,000 without the disease and see where does the genome vary between those with the disease and those without, We'd focus on that part of the genome that varied, and there we'd find the genes involved. It seemed like a reasonable idea, so we took uh, a piece of paper out, an envelope actually, just the back of an envelope. In 2002, just as the genome was coming, the genome sequence was coming to a close, we said, well, you know, we can take these 1,000 cases, 1,000 controls. The NIH has been great at collecting those cases and lots of things like the Framingham Heart Study and stuff for decades, so those are out there already. But you know what we could do is, if we looked at their whole genome, well, we could sequence their entire genome. But back in 2002, it cost someplace around maybe $2 billion to sequence a genome. So that wouldn't make sense to do that 2,000 times. Um, but we thought, well, there are these things called single nucleotide polymorphisms. 
places in the genome where there tend to be variation. There are about 10 million of those across the human genome, places where there's a variation in whether you have an A, a C, a T, or a G in your DNA at that specific site. So we could just look at those maybe to, as a sort of map of the genome and contrast those. So if we took those 10 million common SNPs, 1,000 cases, 1,000 controls, genotype the DNA at all those SNPs, that is, figure out whether it's an A, C, T, or G there. That adds up to doing 20 billion genotypes. In 2002, it cost 50 cents for one place in the genome to figure out whether somebody had an A, a C, a T, or a G. So if you do the math, it's $10 billion <laughs> to do that study for one disease. The NIH budget in those days was, I don't know, something like $24 billion. It was going to be pretty difficult for us to go to all the other institutes at the NIH and say, why don't you give us about half of your budget for this year? We'll do this study, and there's maybe, I don't know, a 5 percent chance that we'll happen to do it on a disease that's actually of interest to your institute. So, so we thought, well, that's not going to win friends and influence people. So we put the envelope back in the desk, and we didn't forget about it, but we didn't tell anybody about our kind of strange thinking. Uh, but then something nice happened called the International HapMap Project. This was a large project uh, that, again, uh, the, uh, the National Human Genome Research Institute led, which was an international effort to look at really variation in the genome. And it told us lots of things about variation in the genome. One of the things it told us about variation in the genome is that it made very clear what uh, I'm fond of saying many, all of us who live in Washington, D.C. already knew, which is that we have not evolved very far as a species that uh, we're a very young species, and because we're so young and haven't evolved very far, we tend to inherit our genome in large chunks. So it turns out that among those 10 million SNPs, there are some of them that if you can tell me for sure somebody's got an A there rather than the usual T, I can tell you with pretty good accuracy, maybe for a thousand base pairs on either side of that A, exactly their complete genome sequence for that block. So that's a nice shortcut that we got through, uh, through the HapMap project. That allows us to say then instead of doing those 10 million SNPs, we could just look at about 500,000 of them. For some studies a little bit more, for some a little bit less. We could do again do these 1,000 cases, 1,000 controls, the same kind of thing. But now instead of having to do 20 billion genotypes, you only have to do 1 billion. So we've just knocked our price down to only 5 percent of what it was before. But the other nice thing that happened, because of new technology driven partly by that HapMap project, the price of doing a genotype in that five years, as I'm fond, some people heard me say this yesterday, I apologize for saying it to you again, um, it's the only thing, the only expense or money related thing that's dropped more quickly this decade than your IRA. The price of this went from 50 cents in five years to a twelfth of a penny. And it's continued to go down since I've stopped making, remaking this slide after I had to keep knocking this down and down and down. So by 2007, the price of doing this so-called genome-wide association study, looking across the whole genome, had gone from $10 billion to $800,000. Still not something you're going to do out of, you know, your pretzel money or something, but something for the NIH, which by that point had a budget of maybe $27 billion, you could go to institutes and say, do you want to find the genes involved in atherosclerosis? Do you want to find the genes involved in autism? Do you want to find the genes, find, you know, name your common disease? Well, that seemed to be a pretty wise investment to a lot of institutes. And what happened, this is the first of these so-called genome-wide association studies, or GWAS as we call them, that came out in 2005, actually even before the the HapMap was finished, but using haplotype, the international haplotype map, we call it the HapMap for short. Using HapMap data, it's a group that looked at age-related macular degeneration, which is the first or second leading cause of severe vision loss in the U.S. And having done that, they found eventually three different genes that, in fact, are very much involved in the causation of AMD. Now, AMD is a disease that nobody thought was particularly genetic before that. That is family history. Well, we knew it raised your risk, but most people, nobody said, well, it's a genetic disorder. But clearly, genes play a large role because together, uh, actually using the three most common genes, it's over 50 percent of the attributable risk of the disorder is due to the variance in those genes, common variance amongst the population. Now. A lot of people say, well, that's great, but these genome-wide association studies allow you to look for people with these common variants and tell them that they have an increased risk for developing this disorder. 
very powerful part of healthcare, in ter particularly in terms of prevention and that kind of thing, early diagnosis. But what's even more powerful, and this is the thing about genetics and genomics that a lot of people, I think, don't uh, appreciate fully, and that is that this tells us something about the underlying biology of the disease. Almost nobody thought that AMD was an inflammatory process, but all three of these genes are involved in inflammatory pathways. So this is a huge hint that this is at its root at least partly an inflammatory process. And in fact, what you might try to do to treat AMD is use something called anti-inflammatories. We certainly got a bunch of those around. You could even think about maybe prevention. If somebody has variations in these genes that puts them at a much increased risk for developing AMD, the first thing you should do is tell them not to smoke, because in fact smoking is far and away the largest environmental factor in AMD. But the second thing, you could begin to think about, gee, maybe if we started anti-inflammatories before you develop the disease, it would prevent it or at least put off um, when you would devent, uh, develop it. And there are now some trials ongoing to see if that approach might be helpful. This is, you know, should I be using a microphone particularly for those in the webinar? Is, are you hearing me okay? Okay. Uh, so this is a map of uh, all of our chromosomes here. And this is showing the first finding in 2005 for AMD. But things progress pretty quickly from there. So this is 2006. We added a few more. First quarter of 2007, by the middle of 2007, genome-wide association studies had found on various chromosomes these things and all kinds of, it's pretty small down here, but all kinds of different diseases, colors coded, were showing up on different chromosomes, different genes being involved. By the third quarter, by the end of 2007, we were beginning to find genes involved in lots of different disorders. Here we go through 2008. So by the end of 2008, by the end of 2008, we had to change the slide we were showing this on. We used to ha have a different one, which is even more visually appealing, but we ran out of room on the slide, so we couldn't use that anymore. This is the first quarter of this year, and this is where we stood as of a couple of months ago. So from 2005, when we had one, to the middle of 2009, we now have 439 well, actually, by now we have over 450 published genome-wide association studies with p-values less than 5 times 10 to the minus 8th. Um, pretty good p-values. Uh, so these are things we believe are real. So we now have 439 genes. Some of them repeat, so it's maybe not 439 genes, but 439 that various times that various genes have been implicated in what we think is a believable way. Uh, as being involved in, in one or more of these specific dozens of diseases listed down at the bottom of the slide. So now if you go back to that slide we had before, you'd have to put this huge sudden increase, this sort of exponential growth. Now instead of being down here in single figures, we're up in triple figures. It's actually well up there now in terms of the number of diseases for which we know genes that are involved, common diseases. Huge change. Now, has that meant anything different in healthcare patients? For a few patients, actually, it already has, but it's only a few. Ten years from now, it's going to have huge impact. So what else is going on in genomics? A small sampling of things. This is uh, the journal Nature had every December at the end of its year issue says, you know, sort of spotlights what, are, what does it think the big advances in science were that year. Well, interestingly, and this is not just about biological sciences, this is about, you know, sciences in general, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They talked about personal genomics going mainstream as being the major event of 2008, and they cite various kinds of things. That includes these kinds of things. If you don't want to read Nature and you read Time magazine instead, uh, what was their number one invention of 2008, the retail DNA test? Uh, as some of you know, there's now direct-to-consumer testing. You can, there are various um, purveyors of this, Navigenics, 23andMe, and others for about $399. They will, uh, if you send in a cheek swab, they will analyze that for you. And basically, you get a report back of a lot of these single nucleotide polymorphisms, variants, and they um, would purport to tell you various things about your health status. It's a long, long discussion about how worthwhile the information you get actually is, but you'll get a fair bit of information. Um, my favorite of these services is this one, uh, Dating DNA, uh, whereby if you swab the inside of your cheek and send it off, uh, they promise to tell you who would be a good mate for you. Uh, I haven't checked this site out recently, both because uh, the NIH blocks one from going to this site. 
And that's, so that means I can't do it from work. And at home, my wife won't let me. So between the two, I have no access to this site. I can't tell you whether it's still up there or not. Uh, this clearly moves in the area of beyond anything that has any scientific basis. But it's a, well, if you want to sell snake oil in the Wild West of this century, as opposed to the last, go into DNA. Uh, I would definitely advise you to do that. Now, part of your job and part of your student's job is going to be to help patients distinguish from the, the snake oil from the testing that actually will be incredibly valued, potentially life-saving for them. That's an important mission. So if you don't like time, if you don't like nature, uh, Science Magazine, which again deals with all kinds of different parts of science and stuff, what were its top breakthroughs for 2008? Well, genomics didn't do as well as it did in 2007 when genome-wide association studies were the cover story for this issue of science. But in 2008, we still got two out of the top ten. Number ten was sequencing bonanza, that is improvements in sequencing technology to be able to sequence genomes. Uh, and I'll talk about that. And then the other one was cancer genetics, cancer genomics, understanding the genes involved in cancer. And I'll say something about that, which was number three on their hit parade. Uh, there's been a project that uh, we, in the last couple of years, uh, both uh, our institute and the National Cancer Institute here at the NIH have co-led, co-funded, called the Cancer Genome Atlas. And originally it was a pilot project to look at uh, three different types of tumor and to really be able to figure out what are the genetic changes in cancer. I mean, cancer, of all the diseases we deal with, is in some ways the most, quote, unquote, genetic, because every cancer, of course, every individual cancer is the genetic apparatus of a cell somehow gone awry. Well, let's catalog the variations that are responsible for cancer, because then we'll be able to attack cancer in a much more effective fashion. The first publication that came out of this, what we call TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, it's not quite an accident that the initials are the same as the four initials. We're geneticists and genomes are a pretty nerdy bunch, so we took this as like a great thing to come up with these four initials, you know, that were the four bases of the, of the human genome, TCGNA. I think that was Francis Collins' contribution to TCGA was late at night Francis does things like this, came up with that name. Anyway, um, the first publication was about genes involved in glioblastoma multiforme, which uh, many of you will know, of course, is a common and to this day devastating uh, brain cancer. It's the one that Senator Kennedy uh, recently uh, died from. Uh, and this tells us something about the basic biology of glioblastoma we've never known before is already beginning in some centers to change in some ways the people uh, provide glioblastoma care. And this is something that was just published a year ago. This has gone from a pilot of just looking at three cancers has just been recently announced. So I hope it's been announced. I think it's been announced. If not, I'm announcing it now. Um, <laughs> that it's going from a pilot. I'm trying to think if we, I'm not sure. Anyway, well, I am announcing it now. If I, um, that it's going from a pilot to looking at 20 to 25 uh, tumors over the next few years. And what we'll be doing is sequencing both the cancer and normal tissue from a couple of hundred people with each of those 20 to 25 cancers to really get a good catalog about what are the common and what are the rare variants in, the, in cancer A, cancer B, cancer C, et cetera. And eventually, we would hope to get to all human cancers. Thank you. So what else is going on? In terms of technology, this thing about the $1,000 genome, we've been talking about this for years. You'll remember I said, well, just a few years ago, it cost maybe $2 billion to sequence a genome. By 2014, probably sooner than that, we think now, it'll cost $1,000 to sequence a genome. If you can sequence someone's genome for $1,000, and since the genome, besides for cancer, is, is pretty static, it doesn't change during someone's lifetime, is it'll be a simple thing in healthcare to sequence everyone's genome, have that as part of by then, who knows, maybe we'll have electronic health records. It'll be part of their electronic health record and available. As we then understand what all the variants mean, it'll be just there, easy to pull up. When you think about, does somebody have this diagnosis or another diagnosis, well, let's look what their variants are, because if that makes them more likely to have A than B, maybe we should think much more likely of A as their diagnosis, in terms of picking out what drugs we'd use to treat it, et cetera. Because the cost of sequencing keeps going down. This is Moore's law that everyone brags about in computers. It's a logarithmic scale here, keeps going down. Well, the cost of sequencing genomes is going down at way faster than Moore's law. It's one, today it's one fourteen thousandth of what it was 10 years ago, and we think the price is going to continue to go down. 
So that gives us a chance to think a little bit about genomic health care. Unfortunately, I've used up most of my time to talk about the other things, but let me quickly just run through this. So how is genomics really going to change health care? Well, the first thing is, as we talked about with AMD, the idea of changing our basic understanding of the biology of diseases and of health. And to talk more and more about defining disease not by its symptoms, but by its causation, which makes it much easier. If I say everybody who wheezes has asthma and I try to treat them all the same way, it's going to fail a lot of times because these are very different diseases. Asthma just means that you're wheezing. That's the end stage of it. It's not the disease. It's the symptom that we're labeling. If you think instead about what's the biology that caused the disease, it makes it much more effective to treat it and certainly in preventing. It's hard to prevent a symptom. You need to prevent the disease. And it's going to do other kinds of things. The idea of once we know about uh, what someone's genetic predilections for disease are, we might change screening for them. Uh, for instance, how often should someone have colonoscopy? What age should that start? Well, it depends who they are bio biologically. One size, well, it's a bad figure of speech for that. One size does not fit all for colonoscopy. You need to really think about at what age, who should have it. The same thing for mammography and other kinds of screening that are very effective today, but could be much more effective where they targeted more specifically to individuals. The idea of dealing with people's lifestyles in a very individualized way. Sure, nobody should smoke. Um, but that's even more important for some people than others. Specific parts of diet will be more important. Some people, it doesn't matter how much cream they, they have, and they'll never get atherosclerotic. Other people, that's incredibly important to avoid uh, cream in their diet, for instance. The idea of using pre-symptomatic medical therapies for, you know, we talked about AMD, somebody who's not even symptomatic yet, if you have enough of a biological um, likelihood of developing disease, treat it before it even starts may be treated with new drugs that are aimed simply at that one genetic glitch that they have, one way or the other, to prevent that from really demonstrating itself. This gets the whole idea of pharmacogenomics, coming up with new drugs, et cetera. It's interesting, if you look at the human genome, these 20, a little bit over 20,000 genes that we have, if you look at all the genes that we have and all the proteins they make, if you took all the drugs we know today, over-the-counter, under-the-counter, street-corner drugs, any drug you want to talk about in the world, what percentage of the genome do you think we have drugs targeted against? Do you think we have a drug targeted at all of the genes and the proteins they make, or just three-quarters of them or whatever? So here's your first uh, quiz of the course or whatever. Think about that. Come up with an answer. It's 2.5 percent, only 500 of our 20,000 genes. Now, it may be that, that a large part of our genome is, quote, unquote, not druggable, that there will never come up with good drugs to target them. But even you will say, well, yeah, let's guess that's half of the genome that's not druggable. That would still mean that we've only occupied 5 percent of the biological space that we might occupy with drugs. So the idea of coming up with completely new drugs, there's I mean, a whole area called chemical genomics that's doing that. This is a publication. Uh, from 2008, uh, in which chemical genomics, this idea of looking at large collections like hundreds of thousands of small molecules and being able to interrogate over a day or two um, these candidates uh, basically against uh, specific diseases, was used for schistosomiasis to be able to come up with some new lead compounds for schistosomiasis, which I can tell you in animal testing look quite promising. Uh, and again, genomics was the key to doing that. We're starting uh, now at the NIH something called the Therapeutics for Rare and Neglected Disease Program. Congress has given us an extra $24 million this year to start a program to use those kinds of techniques to come up with new drugs, particularly for rare diseases and neglected diseases. That means basically diseases which are rare enough or strike people who are poor enough that traditional pharmaceutical companies have not been interested in doing all of the upfront development. So we're going to try to do upfront biological development through NIH centers, et cetera, and then be able to hand them off to drug companies that can then go through the production phase, et cetera. Long story, but an important project you'll hear more about. Oh, this is to advertise. I had to take Francis's name off of this because once he got appointed the NIH director, um, it became a conflict of interest for him to be involved. Um, but I and another uh, guy who works at the National Human Genome Research Institute are going to be doing editing a series of articles that are going to appear in the New England Journal starting in January, I believe, January, February of next year. There will be 13 to 15 articles about 
gee, how can you actually use genomics in healthcare today? Not what does it mean 15 years from now, but how might you use it today? You might find that of help. Already, though, um, those of you who don't know this, I think I'm allowed to advertise that volume since I have no financial or other stake in it and didn't even write it. Some of the people here did, but uh, it's a very useful resource, again, that's particularly some of you were saying needing uh, resources particularly aimed at nursing. Well, there's one for you. In terms of thinking about roles for nurses in the genome era, you'll be able to do a much better job of this than I can, particularly after a year you will, but you should be thinking about these kinds of things because there are multiple roles for nurses here. And I would argue, and I suspect you would agree and maybe even argue more forcefully than I would, that there's some of these that nurses are particularly as a profession, if you can throw one you know, blanket thing over a whole profession, are particularly well positioned to do. A lot of this plays along with some of the principles, some of the ethos, some of the teaching fo focuses of nursing um, in terms of being patient advocates, of speaking for patients, of educating patients. Besides lots and lots of research, we need to understand how to use this stuff within healthcare systems. It's just another very long lecture. If we're ever going to use it well, that needs to be thought of by people who are actually taking care of patients. So let me close by giving you what might sound like a hypothetical story, but I think it's pretty reasonable, actually. It's the story of Betty, who completes something called the Surgeon General's Family History Tool. Is that something they'll hear about at some point? Or it's a web-based web resource for people collecting family history information that we think is uh, pretty nice, pretty easy to use for lay people, that patients can actually enter their own information, organize, et cetera. Anyway, so Betty completes this thing at the age of 18. She learns that she had three uncles who died of early heart disease. She consults her health care team who say, well, gee, by 2019, we can sequence your genome for probably by then for maybe a few hundred dollars, so let's do that. She says, yeah, but what about, you know, genetic discrimination? If I find out these variations, might I, you know, lose my job or have health insurers discriminate against me? You say, no, no, don't worry about that. There's federal legislation that protects you against that by 2019 very fully. We have partial protection already. Um, so that happens. Betty's found to have five genetic variants that well-validated studies have conclusively shown increase her risk of early heart attack by threefold. Working with her healthcare team, she designs a program of prevention that's based on diet, exercise, and some specific medication that's targeted to her genetic makeup. She does well until the age of 75 when she develops some left arm pain. She assumes it's due to gardening. She's a very active gardener at 75 because of her good health. But her primary care provider, knowing about her genome sequence and this family history of these three dead uncles says, aha, pretty typical presentation of a woman with an MI. And so correctly diagnoses that she's having acute MI. Looks at her genome sequence, figures out exactly which drugs will she metabolize in a way that will be most effective. And she does find is surviving well into the 22nd century. So that's what your students will be doing if you go back and do a good job of teaching them. If you don't, Here's what happens to Betty, okay? So Betty never even hears about the Surgeon General's Family History Initiative. Her primary care team is way too busy filling out insurance forms to ever ask about her family history, so nobody knows about these dead uncles. They're still just as dead, but nobody knows about it. Betty's offered genome sequencing, but her brother's lost his long-term care insurance because it turns out that there's no good comprehensive um, legislation to prevent that, so she says, nah, this is not worth, why should I, I don't have any particular family history, I'm not going to bother with this, I could lose my long-term care insurance or something. So she eats a typically unhealthy diet, she gains weight, she develops hypertension. While tests predict which drug would be most effective for her hypertension have been proposed, they've never been done because people never got interest in that kind of research, so they're not reimbursed, and since they're not reimbursed, nobody's using those, so instead, Betty uses another drug for hypertension. She develops a hypersensitivity reaction, and she quickly and wisely stops her treatment. So after 10 years of uncontrolled hypertension, this Betty develops her left arm pain at age 45, not 75. Her primary care team, unaware of her high risk because they don't know about the dead uncles, they don't have her genome sequence in front, et cetera, assume it's musculoskeletal and prescribe bed rest. So she gets her bed rest and returns to the ER the next morning in a cardiogenic shock. The absence of her genome sequence prevents anybody from really coming up with a particularly optimal therapy for her, so she dies in the emergency room. So Betty is in your hands. <laughs> if you do good work this year, 
Betty will live well, well past 100 and be forever grateful to you. If not, she's dead in the ER at the age of 45. So that's the future, and we welcome your helping us navigate the future. And I'd like to come back to someone who said something, I think, earlier about the partnership that's going to be formed around this table and with a lot of the people on the periphery of the table as well. And that's what this is really about. I think the real promise of what you're doing is the longitudinal nature of it. And we really are for looking for developing relationships among the people here, among the institutions too. The NHRI clearly is very interested. You know, our mandate is to do things with genomics. That includes applying it to healthcare. Lots of other institutes at NIH, certainly NCI, but lots of other institutes are in very interested in that as well. So we look forward to ways that we can partner together to do that. So I didn't go over too much, but I did some. Do we have time for questions, or do we need to hook me off the stage? Okay. Yeah, All right. Okay. In that case, I will leave it. You. You're welcome. So our, our next speaker, we're really delighted that uh, Dr. Julie Eager was able to join us from Clemson University. Uh, she received her BSN from the University of Kansas, her MN from Wichita State University, a PhD in microbiology from Clemson University, and a post-master certificate as a GNT also from uh, Clemson University. Uh, Dr. Eager has previously taught at a number of universities, including Texas Women's University, Tulsa University, Loretta Heights College, Denver, Colorado, University of Utah, and currently she's an associate pro professor and healthcare genetics doctoral program coordinator at Clemson University quite a mouthful, but there's really no one that we could think of who's better able to speak to, you know, what do you really need to know about basic genetics and genomics as a faculty member. So, Thank you. welcome. Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate that introduction. Um, I tell everyone I'm nationally known because I've lived everywhere <laughs> and worked everywhere. Um, I. It is a pleasure and an honor to be invited to um, talk today. And I guess the other issue that I was concerned about is I have 45 minutes to talk about what we need to know about genetics and genomics. And I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> Let's see, you spell? No. So um, this is going to be just simply what do nursing faculty really need to know? And so this is. Um, my interpretation. So the first thing I want to say is the slides are really adapted from the Cancer Genomics PowerPoint presentation that is on the NCI website. Now I did that not because I was lazy, <laughs> but because I thought, you know, those are excellent slides and they're also available to all of us for free and they really are a good option for teaching our students. And so that was um, another reason. My objectives, identify basic genetic and genomic concepts for what nursing faculty really need to know, describe basic pharmacogenetic genomic concepts for what nursing faculty really need to know, and then finally suggest application of basic concepts in classroom and clinical settings based on the AACN Essentials of Baccalaureate Education for Clinical Practice. In listening to you all, um, earlier this morning, I am going to add a few things as I talk, but still try and meet my 45 minute deadline. So I'll be looking at Jean for the high sign and red flag. Okay, so first of all, it is important to be able and share with our students exactly what is the human genome, and we know they're all going to know, oh, we know what that is. But I think that it's important that we review with them very simply just talking about the human cell, what um, the basics are 
in the um, cell, what the responsibilities of different organelles are, that the chromosomes are in the nucleus, how many chromosomes there are, etc. And then again to reinforce that the organelles are in the cytoplasm. Um, another basic concept, one that we all know, DNA is thymine, adenine, guanine, cytosine, making certain that we talk about purines and um, pyrimidines and how they line up together so that they can indeed form that double helix. Um, the basic concept of the central dogma, and that is so important so that students recognize, remember, understand that we start with DNA, um, move to mRNA, that from the mRNA, mRNA we're going to have triplets in the codons, which give us the message for amino acids, which are going to give us the proteins that are so important and give us direction for everything that's going to happen in the body. And so when we think about that, um, a little later I'll give us guidelines for exactly why we need to know that information. And then the karyotype, um, specifically here again we have um, the 22 autosomes and the um, 23rd chromosomes, which are the sex chromosomes. We know, and I always like to share this with the students because they always seem to think um, they don't know this information, that we know the chromosome has a short arm and a long arm and that the centromere is in the middle. So we know the short arm is called the P chromosome and the reason for that probably many of us remember in this room is because it's petite. And I thought, wow, they were so smart to use P for petite. And um, obviously it's a um, French word. So what does Q stand for? Well, what is the Q name for long in the French language? Well, it turns out it's not for anything. It's because Q follows P. <laughs> so, um, I think, again, things like that also help our students remember. And as we um, talk about mitosis and meiosis later, um, we'll reinforce that. So what are the implications for this information? Some might be from the essential nine. Now one thing I want to point out is that a lot of things that I'm saying um, are from the essentials um, seven and nine, but in my opinion, um, probably lots of this information could go into all of it. My task was to talk about basic concepts, but you think about societal implications, ethical implications, communication, there's so much there that is not what I'm saying or talking about, but it does have application. So, communicate effectively. We need to be able to communicate with our professional colleagues. And so it's important that we help the students understand what is the chromosomal GPS for disorders that we talk about in class or that we find in the clinical setting. So one example everyone knows is um, the BRCA1 gene. We know that um, it's on the 17, 17th chromosome. It's on the Q arm, so that's the long arm at position 21. And so it helps, again, the students be able to start talking about and communicating what does all this mean. The other point is it moves out from the chromosome, uh, excuse me, centromere. So you can see that the numbers get larger the further away from the centromere. So then what are the um, keepers of the code? Again, this is an NCI slide. It's really pretty colorful. It talks about the go part, which is at the promoter side. It's the five prime end moving down to the three prime end, which is the stop. Um, we notice that there are splice sites, exons and introns. And I don't know about you all, but my students always have trouble with, so is it an exon or is it the intron? So in my simple mind, exon is a gas, means go. So our genes need to go and give us information so that will stay and the introns will leave. So exon is going to help us with the genetic um, message. So then that's going to um, give us the mRNA. We're going to have non-coding reg regions. The importance with non-coding regions is that some of those will come and go depending on which protein that we want. And that's another piece of important information to share with our students. 
Um, remember I talked about the um, nucleus versus the cytoplasm and that um, the reason that's important, we remember the ribosomes are in the cytoplasm. So obviously we're going to have the DNA message moving via mRNA into the cytoplasm. We see the triplets, and let me see if I can. Um, we see this message that will become the triplet codons, and this will then give us the amino acid um, message, red as the three triplets. And so this is the RNA processing before translation. And again, we see the DNA exon, introns. We get rid of the introns, have our exons, and then we translate down to the protein. So here again is our triplet code spelling for the amino acid. The first one, the GO, is AUG, and it always spells GO. And it's here, but it also spells methionine. Um, and I decided I like the DNA um, alphabet because it has three letter words and not four letter words. And so that's another thing that's important to help our students remember. So we have three letter word that is a go message. And then we continue on with our different um, amino acid triplets to help us grow our protein. And then the stop message will be these three. So then we move on, and the thing that's important to remember is that many amino acids have many spellings. Some only have one, some have many. So why is that important? Well, obviously, um, if you have, this one has um, the start message also. Tyrosine has two, tryptophan has one, if you misspell tryptophan, you're not going to get the correct amino acid. Therefore, there's a high probability that we'll have a dysfunctional or non-functional protein. So these are just examples of some of the amino acids and why we need to have the um, correct triplet spelling. The other thing is um, if we would help our students learn, talk about this, this position means that um, it's pretty easily exchanged and still have no problem. And you can see here's a guanine, here's an adenine, here's a cytosine, here's a thymine. So the third position doesn't create as many problems as the first and second. Okay, so then that moves us when we think about the triplets and the um, DNA and the adenine, cy cytosine, guanine, thymine message, if we have one single nucleotide, if we have one thymine or one cytosine, if we have one nucleotide that is not correct, then that is called a single nucleotide because it's only one that has been changed, a single nucleotide polymorphism. Now, it turns out that these are considered frequent, meaning that there's more than, um, they occur more than 1% of the population. They occur in more than 1% of the population. So um, a SNP is going to be something that occurs um, commonly, if you will. A mutation occurs less commonly. So let's talk about that just a little bit more. If we have, a SNP or a mutation, again, it's going to be one mm -hmm. nucleotide, one letter. So if our normal protein gives us the message that the big red dog ran out, that's our normal protein. If we have one letter change, a single nucleotide polymorphism, it could be that it gives us a missense. And in this situation, it says the big red dog red ran out. Well, it's not a red dog, but it is a rad dog. And while it's not the same message, we still get what's going to be happening. The dog's going to be running out. Um, if we have lots of the letters deleted, then we're going to have something that is a nonsense mutation. And we just get a message that says the big red. So we're going to have a protein that does not work. 
It could be that we have a deletion, a frame shift deletion. So we lose one and everything shifts down. The breed da 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 girl, what does that mean? Who knows? <laughs> or frame shift insertion, and we have it going the other way, and people don't know again. What does that mean? So it's a protein that is not working. Okay, so when we think once again about polymorphism, I've told you that polymorphisms occur in more than 1% of the population. So you guys, if you'll look around the room, look at the person next to you, we know that we're 99.1% the same, 99.1% the same, and so the things that make us different are our polymorphisms, okay? And those are very common, and many of them, and then mutations are considered very rare. So when you think about an example to help us communicate this with our student, and um, Kathy and I have talked about this before, we both came up with the same example, and I've never heard her, and she's never heard me talk. So anyway, um, the best example for me was cakes. We have a cake recipe, and we know what the ingredients are, and we'll say that the most common type of cake, the wild type of cake, is chocolate. Okay, so the most common type of cake is chocolate. And we would also call that wild type because it's the most common type. Um, I think that that's an interesting name too, wild type. It's like people that have brown hair, that's the most common type of hair color. But wouldn't you think blondes are more wild than brunettes? So anyway, wild type. So we have our chocolate cake. Well, then we realize that if we change our recipe just a little bit, we can have strawberry cake. Well, that's still a good cake, tastes good. We can have lemon cake, red velvet cake, um, wedding cake. Um, I'm not certain what all those others are, but they're still cake and they taste really, really good. So it's just a change in the recipe. Then at some point, the recipe changes and we get something that we don't want and we don't expect. And in this situation, it's a cookie. And someone says, well, there's nothing wrong with a cookie. Well, I didn't want a cookie. And so in this situation, it would be a mutation because it's not wanted. Typically, a mutation is not going to be working appropriately. It would be a dysfunctional or a non-functional protein. Okay, so then to move a little for further, a mutation is a change in the normal base pair sequence. It's commonly used to define DNA sequence changes that alter protein function. Well, we've already said that and reinforced it. So how would we use this information in the, in the um, nursing education setting? Well, first of all, it might help us identify and describe disease or disorders that are affected by these abnormal proteins um, or the abnormal genes. Um, oncology is a good example. It might help us discuss biomarker, biomarkers that identify dysfunctional proteins. Or it might help us identify new treatments. So again, in the clinical setting, as we um, assign patients, it would be something that we could talk with them, with the students about and say, okay, how does genet genetics impact this particular patient? So then when we think about mutations even more, a um, little deeper, we know that there are somatic and there are germline mutations. And somatic mutation, well, let's start with germline. Germline means that it's present in the egg or the sperm, germline. Um, it seems to me that that would be bacterial induced since it's a germline, but indeed we know that it's ova or sperm. These are heritable and they cause, in this situation, um, cancer family syndromes, but it can also cause other family syndromes. So it affects all cells in the offspring. All the cells are affected in germline mutations. The other example is somatic. Somatic occurs after 
birth at some time, after birth at some time, and it is not in all the cells. So it's not heritable, it's only a few of the cells, and it's called a somatic mutation, for an example, sporadic breast cancer. So examples of somatic uh, mutations could be normal lung cell, and then we see something that causes um, a mutation or a change, and it accumulates more and more DNA mutations and problems until we see a lung cancer cell develop. So again, this is one cell that develops into a cancer. Another example is diabetes. You would have a normal cell, and um, one theory of diabetes is that it's virally induced, and so it could be that in that cell we would then have um, some changes, mutations, and it would create a diabetes islet cell with non-functioning um, protein. So essentials seven and nine then talk about identifying patients with germline versus somatic disorders in all clinical settings. So it could be OB, it could be um, med surg, it could be geriatrics. Um, as a GNP, I see people not using genetics and geri. Um, perhaps we could use it to assess dysmorphisms. They always, when I was in um, clinical, talked about funny looking kids. And in reality, um, are there um, changes that might mean that there's something going on with this patient that is genetic? And so that could be important. And then discuss the patient, implica patient education implications. Um, mitosis and somatic, so we know that mitosis is associated with somatic mutations. Again, because it's only one cell, not all cells. And then we see meiosis or me, which would be germline becoming me, osis and germline mutations. Um, nursing education implications for this, again, could be, it um, follows essentials seven and nine. Family and patient education regarding prevention and screening of germline mutations. So being able to talk with the families and the patient about what does this mean for the patient, but what does this mean for my grandchildren? Um, one thing we also always talk about is that with all the um, changes like Dr. Um, Guttmacher was describing this morning, probably in the next 20 years when we all fly somewhere, they'll just give us our DNA sequence as we get on the airplane and um, we won't be going through some of these changes, perhaps, who knows. Um, explanation about medications for prevention or customized therapy, especially we're seeing this happening in oncology. And I'll talk about um, pharmacogenetics in just a second. Um, de novo mutations. Um, no family history of hereditary cancer prior to this or no family history of any disease that we're seeing in um, offspring and then we see new mutations in the germ cell. Um, implications include the essentials using family history if there's a, to see if there is a de novo. Um, looking at some of the lab technology, for example, sky chromosomes, um, I, th I love to see these because this shows how the chromosomes are not all the same. There are large deletions, insertions, translocations, and therefore we see different changes. Um, this is an example of translocation of the genes, and so um, again, this would be important to be able to describe with students. Genotype versus phenotype, what's in the gene versus what is manifested in the patient. Um, essentials, talk about with the students in the clinical setting, again, or with case studies, what is genotypic versus phenotypic in, in what we're seeing. Um, utilize assessment skills to, again, identify the dysmorphisms. Um, you could even play a didactic game of who am I and give them a situation and then have them figure out what disorder is this. And then you could take it on further and have them talk about, well, what would you 
look for um, diagnostically? What would you want to see is there? What would you see for treatments? What would nursing interventions be? Patient advocacy related to the fact that some of these populations are different because of changes that we see. Um, defining alleles, alternate form of a gene. An allele is an alternate form. For example, different hair color gives us a different allele. An allele is a gene, but it's a different form. So if you have blonde hair, brown hair, red hair, those are all alleles. Um, and one is always in charge. If there's a mutation, then someone else, if you will, another allele gets in charge. So t sometimes you can have diseases that are from the same allele, from the same gene, but um, a different locus, a different GPS, if you will, on the gene. And then you have a different phenotype. So it's a same allele, different locus, and different phenotype. You can have a disease that has a different locus, has a different allele, but it's the same phenotype. And the best example of this is breast cancer. Our phenotype is manifestation of a breast lump, a different locus, because there are two different chromosomes, uh, two different loci on two different alleles. Um, penetrance is um, basically, if we can see it, is it there? Um, things that affect penetrance could be important. Talking about genes that might modify DNA damage, repair mechanisms, carcinogens that might affect penetrance, um, hormones like estrogen, age. As we get older, we see pe people have more cancer diagnoses. Um, epigenetics is part of this. What we know about epigenetics is that it tends to occur more frequently with cytosine and guanine, and cytosine and guanine tend to be close to the promoter at the very beginning of the gene. So cytosine and guanine, we might see clusters of that. And so what happens is if you eat lots of McDonald's hamburgers or do other unhealthy things, um, it could be that we start seeing methylation of the cytosine and guanine. So then what happens is that um, as we start transcription, we're here, but the methylation forms in a way like a bridge. So it skips what we typically would see transcribed and goes from here to here. Okay, so when they talk about the DNA does not change with epigenetics, it's because it's skipped, all right? So because of these methyl groups and they actually kind of form like a bridge. So again, what kinds of things would help with epigenetics in the um, classroom setting, talking about nutrition, diet, exercise, because those can actually help kick the methyl um, groups off. So I've said that, um, to prevent certain multifactorial diseases. Carrier frequency um, is another concept, being able to look at prevalence in a population, including um, founder effect. Um, again, good examples might be um, Ashkenazi Jewish populations. Um, and then talking about autosomal dominant, and perhaps in the classroom setting, you don't always have to do all of this from scratch every time, which is what I think a lot of faculty feel like they have to do. Remember back, this is an example of autosomal dominant. This is an example of recessive. This is an example of X-linked. And then when they're in the clinical setting, be able to, again, talk about um, why they think it's which one. And then again, utilizing the pedigree. Um, pedigree, also known as family history. Now, personally, I like Tigger and his family history, um, but in reality, that's not really going to give me very good information about my family or my patients, and so a complete family history is much better. Um, you want to use um, at least three generations. We know that squares are males. Um, it's easy to remember that because all males are square. 
um, and women are well-rounded, right? <laughs> I'm in a fantasy world, but anyway. Um, so then make certain that we can communicate symbols. Obviously, this means that our um, person in this family is deceased, and what we would really like to see is a D for deceased and then the year they were um, died and from what disease. We can see that these two have a partnership and that they had um, three children, one female and two males, and then here we see that there's a carrier, male, and then married to a female, and then we have um, these two children, and these two have a, a marriage or partnership, and we have one child, and then that person had one child also. So the other thing is we've designated generation one, two, three, and four, and then we've also designated that this is the maternal side, paternal side, and theoretically this would be M1, M2 of the first generation, so that they could communicate what is going on with which individual. Also, this could be that they are affected with a disease. So this person could be a carrier, this one is affected, and um, probably we would see something happen here, but remember this is my fantasy world, so everyone as well. Um, okay, so, so, and later on they'll be talking about the Surgeon General's um, site, which is um, a site that students can use to begin to develop their family history. Um, communicate the symbols and make certain they're utilized in all clinical settings. I frequently have students that have said to me, well, Dr. Eggert, um, we learn how to do pedigrees in every single class but we have never used them in clinical. And they really were wondering why that was. And so we did a little, it's not easy, and probably the best approach would be if you're in a med surge and you're working with a patient, maybe you need to just start out with heart disease or start out with cancer or start out with one type of systemic disease or one disease. But the point is we did a little quick and dirty research and we found out that um, it worked in a mobile setting, and the students identified more health problems in their um, pedigrees than the healthcare providers did in their family history. So that um, had an impact on the care they could pro provide. So pharmacogenetics, quickly through this, this um, really was just to show that there is a interaction between genetics, the environment, and drugs, and they all work together for good or for not good. When we think about genetics, we could see changes in the drug target, we could see changes in the transport system, or drug metabolism, which could be CYP, the SIPs, or enzymes. Um, mutations can cause absence of an enzyme, it can cause diminished enzymes, it can cause problems with substrate specificity so the drug cannot target correctly, and it could be that we would have increased enzyme expression. So the rest of this, um, you all, what I tried to just help us remember, this would be great for pharmacology, pharmacogenomics and pharmacology. Um, just remembering that the kind of alleles that we could see would be um, heterozygous, they would be intermediate metabolizers. Um, they could, or excuse me, hetero, yeah, that's right, heterozygous. They could be extensive metabolizers, homozygous. They could be poor metabolizers, recessive, homozygous. Or they could be hyperactive and actually have um, three genes or three alleles associated with that. So why is that important? Because that moves into our inhibitor and inducer, if you will, cytochrome activity. Inhibitor obviously is going to prevent decrease, so the drug isn't degraded, so we have lots of toxicity. So when we're thinking about students in the clinical setting, lots of toxicity, specifically if we knew that a patient was gonna have that problem, we'd be able to identify a better drug or identify early, we need to monitor for these toxicities. If it's an inducer, an inducer, if you will, 
it increases enzyme activity so that more drug is deactivated and there's less drug available for effect. So you can appreciate that inducers need less drug, I mean more drug, excuse me, and inhibitors need less, yes? Okay. So then um, these are, again, just a little more description with the um, two non-functional drugs, poor metabolizers, so they're inhibitors. Versus ultra would be inducers. Um, if you have an active drug versus a pro drug that's a poor metabolizer, things that it would be important for us to point out to students and have them think about in the clinical setting. Um, this just shows, again, poor metabolizers have toxic doses versus ultra don't have an effective dose, another way to look at it. This looks that pro drugs come in and then they have to be metabolized and active drugs are later. Um, this is, I guess, another way to look at this. Um, helping students understand what are cytochrome P450s. Well, it's a group of more than 40 enzyme systems. Um, SIP means that they're human. Who knew that SIP was another word for human? Add a number for the family. For example, SIP1 is the first cytochrome, SIP2, second, etc. Add a capital letter for a subfamily, add a second number for a single enzyme, and then a asterisk and a number for the variant. Okay, so if you have asterisk one, that is the normal gene. Anything after asterisk one is a variant. So asterisk one is normal and then the variants. Okay, so why is that important? Again, because we know that some of these especially the CYP2D6, um, we see this 10% of our patients are poor metabolizers and have this gene, and 7%. So yes, that's not very many, uh, that's very few, but it's still enough that we're going to need to figure out, do we need more drug or less drug? What toxicities, et cetera. CYP2C9, is another example, and then the CYP2C19. So again, decrease the dose versus increase the dose. Um, essentials in the clinical setting, identify the cytochrome family um, in the medications in the diet. For example, grapefruit we know can um, um, cause changes in uptake. Utilize the pedigree to review family history. Could be that there are lots of people that in this family that cannot metabolize codeine, that they actually need morphine. So they're known as drug seekers, when in reality, if we gave them morphine instead of codeine, they would not come back and require more medication. So that's another example. Identify ethnic origin. Um, I have slides later on to reinforce that. These are non-SIP enzymes, but they're still metabolizing. We know there are a lot of enzymes in the body that affect drugs besides the CYP enzymes. One example is this uh, TPMT, um, and we'll practice saying that word during the break. Um, so this is going to depend on the enzyme and the drug. Note the alleles, and what I want to show you here again is that we're going to see lots of toxicities so it'll be important to check red blood cell labs, education, care for mucositis, um, other kinds of toxicities in this particular type. There are some, and I'll show you this in a second, um, there are some that are available um, enzymes that can actually be tested. Um, this is another enzyme. Previously it talked about ethnic groups. Please notice that in the um, Caucasian group, it's the wild type, most common. In African American, we see homozygous is the most common. Asians, it's the least common. So again, we're going to see some different changes in, in people that have um, polymorphisms in this 
enzyme. Um, and this is just an example of what we might need to reinforce with our students. It could be the drug target, an epidermal growth factor, for example, working in oncology. There would be um, implications to work with this. So, why genetic testing? Most medications are prescribed without assurance. These would be good questions to talk with, with students in the clinical um, arena because it's better to find one that works instead of using multiple. Um, there are billions, thousands of dollars that are used at least trying to identify which drug. Adverse drug reactions, trying to prevent those, the importance of patient education. We've talked about assessing the patients, arranging for genetic testing. The CYP2D6 um, has genetic testing available for it through the AmpliChip, and it can be helpful in the um, clinical setting. Um, and again, education about why testing is done after diagnosis but before therapy. Explaining genetic testing, why we only need to do it once. Implications, why different drugs, phenotype versus genotype. Again, this all reflects back to the early information. And then talking about ethnic group variation. I've already identified the difference with codeine. African Americans especially have a low level of that enzyme that converts it to morphine. So again, it reinforces the importance of advocacy, teaching the students about advocacy and further assessing. And then I just included these slides because um, I thought it reinforced the ethnicity here we have Americans, and notice this is that CYP2D6. This cytochrome works on 25% of our medications. So Americans, 7.7% are poor metabolizers, and ultra metabolizers are 4.3. Well, what we know is that Americans are mixtures, right? So then when we move this down, here we have Swiss, 10% poor metabolizers. Spanish ultra, and we keep moving. Notice Ethiopians, 29, very few poor. South Africans, mostly, or 19% are poor. Um, and then we have Saudi Arabians that do have more admixture than perhaps some of us might have thought. So that reinforces admixture. So the goal of my presentation was to identify basic genetic and genomic concepts for what we really need to know, describe basic pharmacogenetic genomic concepts for what we really need to know, and suggest application based on the essentials. Questions? It's a lot of information. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Please use your microphone. Well, my mind is reeling from a, a from a prescriber's perspective, and when and and I I think we need to expand, of course, uh, this type of lecture for nurse practitioner students. Mm -hmm. How? I mean, just talking from the pharm pharmacogenetics and only one drug that you've talked about, codeine uh, and morphine. I, um, that is a good question. <laughs> mm. And how, I, you know, all I can say is from the perspective I also teach in the nurse practitioner program, that I think it's going to have to be an expanded course that instead of one three hour, it probably is going to have to either be two hours or included in every single class where you have, um, you know, talk about diseases and their treatments. But the other thing is um, remembering that it's not only genetics, that there's a lot of environment that comes into play with that. The focus for us today is baccalaureate, mm -hmm. and I don't think the students need to know all of that information, but they need to be able to recognize that there are certain drugs that especially have impact from the SIPs and the other metabolizing enzymes. And um, those are available on the internet, those are available, um, there is, the textbooks have chapters, and so I think it's easier to see the ones that are most commonly given, the ones that most commonly have lots of side effects, 
Coumadin, for example, can now be tested. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. And, and um, do you see, um, I'm, you know, like people like uh, who write programs um, like Hippocrates, including mm -hmm. this type of information? For they are starting to include it more, yes. Thank we you. have our NP students, FNP students, are um, getting it more from Hippocrates. But I guess, again, I want to point out it, the depth isn't as important, but it is important for the baccalaureate student. They need to be able to communicate what's going on and the rationale behind their concern. Okay, anyone else? You guys are very quiet. <laughs> Thank you. So we will take a break. If you could return back by 10.15.
It's an informational CD. They were working. It's a national journal. They used to get kept. I think it's it's a little five minutes CD because I was it's a good introduction. And I'll tell you what it was Okay. She said there's a chapter script for years ago. I've seen it. I have to do this. I think it's very interesting. It's just a fun And it's just a
Can we all start coming back to the table, please? Probably not. <laughs> uh, this is funny. Gene, I don't remember if you remember. I do. I just spoke to me. Yeah. Thank you so much. It went well. And it was just in here. It was my dean, actually, before I saw it. Can I have everybody come back to the table? I'm sorry. We'll have a little more time to network at lunch, I promise. All right, everybody, you got your caffeine, got your muffin, ready to go. <laughs> so I think we have a good stage set for um, the morning already between doctors uh, Guttmacher and Egert and their presentations. And so we're really going to talk a little bit about implications for nursing practice and education and cover a couple of resources. And um, I've cut a little bit of this down in comparison comparison to what's in your slide set uh, just to make some effort to get us back on track in regards to the um, time so that we're able to get you out on time at the end of the day and still cover all of our content. So I really want to present this framework, which I think Dr. Guttmacher had set up in the beginning, which is that this concept that genetics and genomics is influencing healthcare across the entire healthcare continuum. Um, I think in oncology is where this was recognized the earliest in the Oncology Nursing Society has done some work in that regard. But you can think about this in really from the time of sort of even preconception all the way to end of life, and that the influences that everybody's talked about this morning in regards to risk for disease, um, using genetic and genomic technologies to help diagnose different diseases, um, to treat different tr diseases, the influences for medications all the way through the entire continuum, including uh, what Dr. Eager was mentioning in regards to pain control and end of life even. Um, all throughout that entire continuum is where we're seeing influences. Um, it does give you sort of a flavor of to begin to translate that into your curriculum and to think about how you can do that. It may or may not for a given school be a single isolated course, but an integration of the things that you're already teaching and beginning to look at some of that from a genetic and genomic perspective as opposed to something that's a little different. 
Um, so a lot of what we are basing, what exactly is it that you need to teach to, <clears throat> is both from the perspective of the baccalaureate essentials that Kathy McGuinn and the American Association of Colleges of Nursing have uh, worked so hard on and revised, which are moving into the accreditation standards and the new evaluations. But some of what has been incorporated into that document is based on the essential competencies for uh, nursing in genetics and genomics, which is now in its second edition. You received a copy of that when you came in this morning, and that's what we want to spend a little bit of time of giving you a flavor of what's in that document now and how that was developed so that you understand a little bit about that. And the intent of this was actually to help you guide curriculum content. And a lot of this was what um, ultimately went in from the genetic and genomic perspective into the baccalaureate essentials. So the framework of these competencies is that they're not replacing existing scopes and standards, and that these competencies are actually applicable to all nurses, irrespective of their academic uh, preparation, their role, their clinical specialty. They are applicable to people in practice. They are applicable to students learning about being a practitioner, um, and that the focus is genetics and genomics, um, because that's really where genomics is where we see the largest influence on healthcare today that influences everybody. Um, there are a few language things. Clients are interpreted in this document and used throughout as persons, families, communities, and or uh, populations. Um, and I will make a mention that this was written consistent with Bloom's taxonomy because we were told that all of you faculty members would kill us if we didn't do that. Um, there are two domains. Um, the first is professional responsibilities, and then professional practice, and then subsettings within professional practice, which is assessment, identification, referral, and provision of education, care, and support. Um, these competencies were established by consensus. And it was uh, close to a year and a half to two year process of consensus. And then they went out for endorsement. Um, and endorsement was that organizations uh, were agreeing with the content of the document and that they would support and promote initiatives within their own organization to implement those competencies and that the term of endorsement was for five years. So you weren't signing on to something forever. Um, and there are 49 organizations that endorsed, and I'll highlight a couple groups, most importantly, the American Association of Colleges of Nursing and also uh, the National League for Nursing um, as, you know, two of the major education-associated organizations that have endorsed this. Um, and interestingly, we did not, we consciously made a decision not to solicit endorsements from individual schools of nursing. We didn't feel that was... Um, what this was about or our intent to do that, and it would really be outside the scope of our capacity. Uh, but then we started getting unsolicited endorsements from some schools of nursing. Uh, so some early adopters were with us um, right from the time of consensus. So let me, and I've cut um, some of this back just for the sake of time, talk about the baccalaureate essentials. And we have the expert in the room, uh, Kathy McGuinn, who spent a huge effort and, you know, I think more than a couple of years working on establishing consensus for this document. Um, and uh, we were delighted to see that in the end, genetics and genomics has been integrated throughout and, and mentioned in isolation 16 times. So we're pleased about that. Um, but that you you'll see uh, some core concepts of things like pharmacogenetics and pedigrees and things like that that are indirectly um, genetics and genomics without using those direct terminologies. Um, and so there is a weave throughout, and you'll see that weave introduced right in the executive summary where they talk about the influence of genetics and genomics on health and nursing practice. Um, of the essentials, um, you'll see most of the genetic and genomic content uh, integrated into the clinical prevention and population health and the professionalism and professional values. But I think Dr. Eager gave you a flavor of as you begin to think about how to educate your students about genetics and genomics, there are elements of that that can be woven in to many of the other essentials in meeting some of those um, criteria. Um, and I think that they also uh, emphasize that, you know, this is a very complex 
uh, uh, healthcare environment that you're preparing nurses to practice in, and genetics and genomics is a major component of that and will be an ever increasing component of that. Um, by no means is it the only thing, and we appreciate that, but it is um, a huge element that's influencing healthcare and the healthcare environment and therefore the practice of nursing. Um, we are uh, now just launching, and I say we, not we, but actually the American Association of Colleges of Nursing is launching the revision to the master's essentials. Um, and I think we can anticipate that as that consensus process develops over the next year or more, that we may see, again, more integration of genetics and genomics into that document, which current in its current iteration doesn't have that included, and the uh, document that they will begin to work from with the October meeting um, in Baltimore actually does have some genetics already integrated into that. And as the consensus process builds, I think we may continue to see more of that as time goes on. Um, so it's not just the basic preparation, but that follow through for those of you who are in schools that have uh, programs that prepare nurses for advanced practice to see that this may also change as well. Um, very clearly, we've spent a lot of time trying to hear what it is that you need as a faculty member to meet these competencies, to integrate genetics and genomics into um, your curriculum. And one of the first things was that the competencies are not enough. So what exactly is it that I need to teach to what knowledge do I need to give my students for them to achieve this competency? And so uh, we have um, taken on an initiative and in this second edition of the competencies, integrated outcome indicators. And the outcome indicators include two elements, specific areas of knowledge that support each competency and clinical performance indicators. What are the kinds of things that as a faculty member you could measure your students against? What, what kinds of activities could you integrate into your classroom or clinical experiences that would be of value? These are not prescriptive. So this is not everything that everyone needs to know. It gives you a flavor and an overview of the information that uh, supports the knowledge needed to achieve that competency and some example clinical performance indicators um, so that it gives you a starting base from which to move forward. Um, these outcome indicators were also developed through a process of consensus um, and with many of our expert advisors, many of whom are speakers here today, um, giving us feedback as this went along and helping us develop this material um, so that uh, it would be useful to you as faculty and so working with other faculty to have actually help us develop that. Um, you will notice that there is a considerable amount of overlap. So you will find that there may be specific areas of knowledge that are helping to support more than one competency. And we have presented this at um, meetings with the baccalaureate uh, program at AACN and heard loud and clear from the faculty <laughs> reviewing early drafts of this that they would like that overlap because if they're teaching to a particular competency, they want all of the things they need to think about in one place. Um, and so that's why we've done that, to make it easier for you. Um, this is what they look like. It's in the back part of the monograph that you've received. And so there will be the specific competency, and then the knowledge elements will be on the left, and the performance indicators will be on the right. And again, my only take home message is that, um, you know, what we need to be teaching to uh, may change over time. Um, and that these are just examples, and the clinical performance indicators are examples. They are not prescriptive. They're just giving you an idea of what to start with. So I'm hoping that I've caught us up a little bit in terms of our time. <laughs> uh, being Italian, I can talk very fast. And I just want to make sure that we're sort of all on the same page of the relevance of this. And in many cases, you know, I've certainly heard from a number of people, does this really have anything to do with the baccalaureate prepared nurse and how important is this? How important is the family history? And so I'm going to give you a story about a nurse that I work with 
who I taught to take family histories. And she's a baccalaureate prepared nurse. She works in the National Naval Medical Center, <coughs> which is just across the street here. And she works in their breast care center as a case manager. Um, and so she helps to manage people newly diagnosed with breast cancer. And so she called me one day, <laughs> all in a frenzy. You can't believe what happened, she says. And so she told me this story. She had just hung up the phone. And she had, uh, many, many months earlier, had been uh, taking care of a newly diagnosed breast cancer patient and had gone in. <clears throat> and that person had uh, presented. And as part of her routine assessment, she did the family history. And she asked about all of the elements that are important to family history, including race and ethnicity on each branch of the family, the maternal and paternal lineage, collected that information and then was uh, uh, sharing that with a healthcare provider. And this person had come with a support person, someone who is a friend of hers who is a breast cancer survivor. And when the uh, physician came into the room to do the exam, the case manager exited the room as did the support person. And the support person, who was a long-standing breast cancer survivor, said, well, you know, I was curious about this family history. I didn't realize my father's family history had anything to do with, you know, my risk for breast cancer. And I didn't realize that my ethnic background could potentially be important. And this is a woman who had had an early diagnosis of breast cancer and had a paternal family history and was of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. And so being someone who had been taught to these core competencies for all nurses at the baccalaureate level. She knew how to assess. She knew the red flags. That was a red flag. She knew how to make a referral. So she referred this person to a genetic health care provider in their area. And she thought, well, did my good deed for the day. Got more important things to do. I got all these patients to take care of. You know, off I go. Well, the person who had just called her was this support person, the breast cancer survivor, who went to the genetic consultation, found out she did have a risk of harboring a mutation in a breast cancer susceptibility gene, got genetic education and counseling, decided to be tested, was tested for the three mutations that are common in families of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, found out she had a mutation, found out she had an increased risk of not only developing another breast cancer, but also ovarian cancer, <laughs> decided to have her ovaries removed after consultation with you know, experts in the field, had her ovaries removed, and just had hung up the phone from the surgeon who told her they had found precancerous cells in her ovaries. Who was the person who saved her? I think that we can honestly say that one person who made the biggest difference in this case was Barb Ganster. And all she did was very simple things. She knew how to take a family history. She knew what to look for. She knew where to refer. That's baccalaureate preparation. That's what we want to prepare our students to do. So I'm going to end there. And uh, do you have questions? <coughs> going to utilize some of our uh, faculty champion exemplars, people who have begun this process um, of integrating genetics and genomics into curriculum. And we'll, with their stories, hopefully we'll give you some ideas of things that might work in your area. Um, so please turn to the information about Cindy Prowles and Kathy Reed slides in your brochure, and we'll move on to there. So our next speaker is Cindy Prowse, as Jeannie mentioned. Um, she got her BSN and her MSN from the University of Cincinnati. Uh, Cindy has a stellar reputation of actually uh, developing uh, novel online education programs, uh, both for uh, students and practicing providers, and most importantly, her in-person and now web-based uh, 
genetic institutes for faculty, and she'll talk to you more about that this afternoon. Um, she's currently in the Division of Patient Services and Human Genetics at Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. And welcome, Cindy. That was a great story, by the way, Kathy. Powerful story. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I was asked by Kathy to talk about how to um, evaluate um, or use resources for evaluating um, the nursing curriculum. And you've already heard about the baccalaureate essentials and um, the genomic competencies for nurses. And so um, back in um, 2004, Carol Hedeberg and I published a uh, checklist that was developed for, um, from 171 uh, nursing faculty, actually more nursing faculty than that, but from 171 different nursing schools who participated in a genetics education program for nurses Genetic Summer Institute or our, one of our web-based genetics institutes. And they were given assignments to come up with plans for how they were going to integrate genetics into their curriculum. And so this checklist came from, was essentially a summary of what those nursing faculty planned. And <clears throat> there are four components to the checklist, and you do have that checklist in your book, your handout. Um, yeah, right. You don't have the slides because the slides are really not important. It's the checklist, um, although the slides will be available on the web for if you want them for some reason. Uh, and there's four components, determine existing genetics content and identify the gaps, increase faculty awareness about the need to include genetics um, as well as to increase faculty knowledge about genetics, and then um, different strategies for integrating genetics content in the nursing curriculum. For this talk, I was asked to um, focus on determining the um, existing genetics content and identifying the gaps. Well, since the checklist is there in your handout, um, you can read that. But what I thought I would do is um, we have since had several different uh, additional web-based genetics institutes that are attended by nursing faculty as well as advanced practice nurses, um, nurse researchers, and they now get to choose what their change project is going to be. Is it going to um, focus on curriculum or are they going to come up with a plan for how they're going to use genetics in their practice or are they going to come up with a plan for how to um, incorporate genetics into their research projects. So 65 subsequent participants um, from about that many different schools have um, described what they were planning in discussion, in discussion threads. And um, pretty consistent with the checklist, 85 percent assessed their nursing curriculum, primarily didactic courses, and you should start hearing a theme that it's important, yes, the didactic, getting genetics content into the didactic courses is important, but if you don't take it from that those um, courses and help students translate it in the clinical arena, then, then how are they going to actually use it in practice when they go out? So we got to get it into those clinical courses as well. 32% assessed their pre-nursing curriculum. Um, sometimes they were doing that to assess what were the gaps, you know, what content is um, being delivered in the science courses and what gaps in genetics needed to be filled, but also some were just assessing the pre-nursing science courses because they wanted to know what the foundation was that the students were coming in with and then build from that point rather than try to make changes in the science curriculum. And then 28 percent assessed their own courses. The um, other methods that were used um, were kind of informal. And that was to ask individual faculty, what are they teaching? Um, some faculty were simply saying, yes, I have a genetics course, or no, I don't. And that was the assessment. Uh, another thing you're going to hear is while we think that a genetics course by itself is great, 
Um, some of you spoke in the very beginning that that was just not an option in a crammed curriculum. Um, and if you simply put all your ducks into a course and it's nowhere else, um, then again, the students cannot apply it in the different arenas that they're in. Um, and it needs to be threaded throughout. So of course it's great if you can add it, but you know, please um, integrate as well. Uh, some faculty would get all the course descriptions and topical outlines and evaluate it from that and look to see whether objectives had any kind of genetics in it um, and then others were sur surveying faculty. Some of the things that came up in those discussion threads which um, continues to be a, a theme is textbooks um, and you've heard that some of you had mentioned that you know where are the textbooks for this and um, which textbooks are good uh, the textbooks that we use in the web-based genetics institute have are more of the human genetics uh, because in the 18 weeks we are really trying to give um, nursing faculty a foundation so um, but that may not be appropriate. We have some, like we said, some textbooks there and in the back of your um, um, booklet on the genomic competencies, there's some others listed as well. Um, and to determine gaps, oh, that's pretty obvious. To compare them to the baccalaureate essentials uh, and the genetics, genomics competencies. And then, um, some faculty have plans, and I think this is great, um, to evaluate the student's genetics knowledge near graduation, and then one year after they're out in practice. And what a better way to evaluate the effectiveness of your curriculum um, than something like, I think that's ideal, and um, more power to them for doing that. Uh, some um, faculty in their assessment process were identifying um, other faculty who were interested in genetics. That was something that we heard during the genetic summer institutes and we hear in the web-based genetics institute. I don't want to be the lone ranger out there doing all the genetics. I need a team. Um, so finding those other faculty members who are at least interested in genetics, um, who support it but might be a little timid about it, um, and help one another um, make those changes. Also, any genetics um, experts in the community, uh, clinical sites that um, might be available for um, assigning students that where they might get some genetics um, exposure. And, and then also assessing faculty members' genetics knowledge. This is all going to provide you a type of gauge for what kind of curriculum change capacity you have at that time and, and what you need to um, work on. I really liked this quote because we, many of us in genetics, have been kind of preaching the um, importance of getting genetics throughout the curriculum. And um, one of the faculty members said that each course touches briefly on genetics, so cumulatively students skim but never get the whole picture. And I think that is a wonderful insight and a wonderful caution as you start to do this. It has to be a coordinated effort, well-planned strategic um, effort on where are you going to put this genetic content um, and how are you going to build from one another and again, how are you going to help um, those clinical faculty, and I understand that in some of the bigger schools, they're having to rely more and more on part-time clinical faculty. And how are you going to help them be able to get this into their curriculum as well? And later on in the afternoon, I will be sharing some resources that will help. And you'll hear from other faculty who are doing it who will help with that as, as well. So. I'm not going to read through these because I've already talked about some of the updates to the checklist I would do um, if I um, were, re if Carol and I were republishing those. Um, but we already talked about those. There's some, these are the updated um, websites for the PDFs. Uh, and um, the scope and standards is now a 2007 and on the, um, Jack it's the 1998. This was another um, thing that, another suggestion by one of the faculty. 
and I thought, wow, that's a really good idea. I need to start talking to some of the um, some of the nursing faculty in our area that maybe I could do this. Um, and that is to um, invite genetics experts to the pre or post clinical conferences. You know, so if you happen to have the luxury of having some genetic expertise in the hospitals that you go to um, or in the, you know, local area that you can, again, um, invite to some of those um, conferences, that, that would be another area to um, add genetics content. And um, now that's it for my talk. It's nice and brief. And um, <laughs> I'm then going to introduce Dr. Um, Kathy Reed, who will discuss her actual experiences at Boston College um, School of Nursing and um, how she did this. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I missed the introductions this morning. I have a feeling there was some uh, rich information given. Um, I flew in from Boston, so uh, I made it just in time. But um, I, get, I look forward to meeting some of you later on. Um, so I went to my first ISONG meeting about 12 years ago, International Society of Nurses and Genetics. At the time, I was a PhD student looking for some like-minded people, and I'm looking out there, and there they all are. And uh, it was a tremendous um, energy in that small nursing organization that really has sort of mentored me along the way. And now, here I am, standing up here, talking to all my colleagues, um, and it's really an honor and a privilege to be here at this venue to talk about um, one of my passions, which is genetics in nursing and teaching genetics to nursing students. So I come from Boston College. They, they put Boston University on my name tag, but I crossed it off because if you're from Boston, you know there's a big rivalry between Boston University and Boston College. <laughs> um, no one else cares, but it's uh, a Jesuit Catholic University in Chestnut Hill, and we have um, a pretty big baccalaureate program. Maybe not big for some of you, but it's, I have 395 undergrads, and we have a couple of hundred masters, master's entry, and PhD students. And it's an interesting place to teach because we teach across um, levels. So I'm the associate dean for the undergrad program, but I teach pathophysiology in our master's program, and I have several uh, PhD students that I advise. So um, it's really great. It's good for the students, too. My undergrads really benefit from what my grad students and my knowledge from working with grad students um, get me. Anyway, so our last CCNE accreditation visit was um, in April of 08, and somehow I got the job of author authoring the self-study, which is um, a terrifying experience. I know that you're all sort of in the beginning of this, and some of you probably have some experience. I was inexperienced at the time, but I really left the, um, I, I, of course, we were successful, so I was happy, but um, I really uh, became a very strong proponent of the process because um, I learned a lot in it. It's really, it's really a good um, thing for your curriculum, and um, I, I just want to emphasize that I, it, they keep telling you how they're there to help you, and I really did sense that through the whole process. Um, I think we got a lot more out of it, and it's not there. Don't go in there and scrutinize everything you're doing. Now we were using the old essentials. I think we just got in at the last minute for our using the old essentials, so it was a little easier. And now we're doing curriculum change based on the new ones. You're all using the new essentials, and I have to say that they're extremely detailed, they're extremely forward-thinking and fabulous, and many of us in here participated in the drafts of those, and um, so don't, f I guess my, my message is don't feel like you have to have everything. They, they want to see that there's a process working toward the, uh, the baccalaureate essentials, and we're all still doing it, um, but to have essentials that were watered down wouldn't mean anything, so now we have some really um, tangible goals to work for. So in, I, I came to BC in Boston College in 01, and um, I was lucky to come to a university where there were people who were already sort of interested in genetics, you know, Margaret Carney, Sandy Mott, Judy Vesey, so I, I, I was in good company. Um, 01 was a big year. Um, you may have heard this morning what happened in 01, but that's when the Human Genome Project 
finished up, which really was the beginning of our work. Um, so I was very energized at the time. I just finished my dissertation, and um, I decided that I wanted to um, do some work in, in finding out about teaching genetics to undergrad students. This is what I was doing, and I, I really was curious. So along with my colleagues, we decided to um, write this article based on a survey I'm going to talk about in a minute. So you have this article in your packet, and it, it does give more details on some of the things that I'm going to talk about in a second. And then um, Kathy and Jeannie have given you the um, essentials, so I just want to say how long we've really come a long way since 01. It's amazing to me that this document is out in the shape that it is, and it provides us so much guidance. You know, as you do your, um, your self-studies for the, the CCNE visit, your, your main thing is to show how you utilize um, nursing pr uh, professional um, guidances and guidelines. So this can really provide um, evidence that you are, in fact, thinking about these things. Are you going to have it down by the time you have your visit? No, but you're, you're going to be in the process. So the first thing we did um, in 01 was based on some history, and I already mentioned my esteemed colleagues at Boston College who had thought about this before. Um, in the late 90s, um, as part of sort of baccalaureate program committee work, had used Felicia Lash Lashley's guidelines um, for recommended genetics content to, to kind of survey the faculty and, and find out um, what was going on. And there were some recommendations and some follow-up on that. And then more formally, we uh, formed this genetic interest group in 01, and that's a great thing to do in your school. It was just four people, the four people who authored the article, and some random people who came in and out of the meetings as they wanted to. Um, and we had some hard talks about how, how we can do this, how we can make this better, and we all were, had a, a, a emerging passion for it. So um, we decided to... Um, conduct a survey of our course faculty to look at the integration of genetics and, and see what we really did. And you, when you do a survey, you need some sort of guidance for what it is you're going to survey. So at the time, um, the um, niche peg guidelines had just come out, and you have a copy of those. Um, this is the, what it looks like. The niche peg is the National Coalition for Health Professional Education and Genetics. This is a multidisciplinary guidance. This is what all health professionals are recommended to know about genetics. So they're not nursing specific. But at the time, we didn't have the nurse-based competencies. So we used this to um, set up a very sort of informal um, paper and pencil survey that we distributed to our faculty. And the niche peg guidelines look at knowledge, skills, and attitudes that all health professionals should possess. So you can take a look at those. They're um, printed out for you. So I'm um, a proponent of survey research. Um, and a survey isn't the only way to figure out what you have in your curriculum. Um, you know that you could go and look at all the syllabi. But I have found from my personal experience that there are things that are being taught in the course that don't, aren't reflected in the syllabi. So um, we decided to actually ask the faculty. So we uh, constructed this survey based on the niche peg guidelines from 20, uh, the faculty from 20 required science and nursing courses. And we, luckily for me, in my university, um, the students are admitted as freshmen, so they have their science courses in the university, and I know those faculty, even though they're not in the School of Nursing. So that's an advantage. We have a, a four-year program. I get to know them from day one through, um, through graduation. We got 100% response, right? That's easy to do if you don't make it anonymous, and you can... Um, nag people, and it was successful, and, and to get an N of 20 isn't really that bad. This wasn't a scientific survey at all, um, but it was really, um, I, I, I thought it was worth publishing, so, you know, I did, and it, it's, it wasn't as um, daunting a task as I thought. So we, all we did was ask the faculty to indicate whether the competency was met, even partially in their course, and we took out the nine competencies related to the advanced practice role. Um, and we learned that all the competencies were addressed in at least one required course, um, some more than others. So this might not surprise you. You might think the same thing in your school. Um, the competencies most often addressed related to genetics terminology, how identification of genetic variation facilitates clinical care, the importance of family history, and then the need to protect privacy, autonomy, and cultural identity. We, we did better than, than um, average on those. Um, what were the least often addressed uh, that were in the niche peg competencies were indications for a referral, um, history of misuse of genetic information, and ways to access and disseminate current information about genetics and related policy issues. So 
that was 2002, 2003. So um, I haven't repeated that exact survey because it's not exactly the same faculty. But I was curious to know um, last year how faculty felt about um, about genetics and the infusion in the in the curriculum. And I. Um, let me say something else about survey. And I started to say why I was a proponent of survey research because it's not just the data that you receive. It's it was it's the whole diffusion of innovation where people start it, it it heightened everyone's awareness of genetics. That's really all it did. Every faculty member thought, "Wow, you took enough time to survey me on this and here's the points I should be teaching." And all of a sudden it, it, there was a heightened awareness everywhere. It was a very simple thing to implement, and I would recommend that you all do it in one way or another. Now it's so easy with SurveyMonkey. We didn't have that at the time. We did paper and pencil. But even if you don't use the data, and don't be afraid to find out that you don't do things very well. Um, some of your schools probably teach a lot of genetics. I, I know there's a, 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 a lot of crowd from uh, many um, universities who've done a lot on this already. So, um, but. The, it's, it's not, I guess it's not just the outcome of the survey, it's the process of the survey itself. So that last year I did a follow-up. Again, this was not a scientific study at all. All I did was ask three questions. How important are genetics-related concepts in, in the nursing theory and clinical courses that you teach? And um, more than 90% said somewhat or extremely important. I don't think that I would have gotten that result in 2002. Now, I don't know. So like I said, it's not scientific. But um, I, I was pretty happy with that result. I think people have really um, come along. I asked, which of the following best describes your incorporation of genetics related concepts into nursing theory and clinical courses over the past five years? 80%, um, more than 80% said somewhat or a great deal. Again, um, I was pleased with that. There was only 23 responses um, to this and that was not a 100% response rate because I did do this one on SurveyMonkey. And then what are your usual sources of information about genetics related concepts? It was highly variable. Most people put periodicals and online sources, um, a, li a bit lesser um, re uh, reliance on course textbooks. As we know, textbooks, as wonderful they, as they are, they're a couple of years out of date by the time we actually get them in our students' hands. The popular press, you heard Dr. Guttmacher um, with his Time Magazine, and I have to tell you, I've used Time Magazine a few times because um, they can scoop the news before I get a chance to get to the scientific literature. And then some, there, there are some other sources like word of mouth, going to conferences, et cetera. So people get um, information in all different ways. So when you go to do a survey and you go to, or, or more importantly, you go to write your self-study, you want to show the um, professional nursing guidelines and standards that you're going to be looking at. So there's a lot of things. I'm going to mention a couple of them that are good or, or not good, and you can decide for yourself. Because like I said, if you're going to do a survey, you want to go by something. You don't want to make it, make it up in your head. So the first thing I, we always, that's very important to us as baccalaureate nurse educators is the NCLEX RN test plan. It was the most recent version is on the web from 2007 and I'm sure you all know how to access that. And the other one is what we are immersed in right now and that's the essentials of baccalaureate nursing education. So you, you have that and um, I'm going to talk for one second about those. So you may or may not know this, but there's only one time the word genetic is mentioned in the RN detailed test plan for the NCLEX. Um, so I think we have a really long way to go because we all know that we, we, we say we don't teach to the test, but the reality is our students have to pass the licensure exam. And if we're not addressing what's in that, now they've re redone the, um, the, uh, the job study, I forget what it's called, that the NCLEX is, is based on, uh, uh, practice analysis, that's what it's called, it's on that. The t but, um, you know, it takes a long time for, for that to get in, and, and Kathy has mentioned how, uh, and, and so has Cindy, about um, genetics not being incorporated in the clinical courses as much as they are in the theory courses. And I think this is where the big gap is that we're all going to have to address in the, in the many years. And of course, when it becomes a requirement of their day-to-day -day care of the patient, it's a little bit easier to incorporate it. Um, but we're sort of in that gray area right now where we have to help them pick out the genetics aspects.
Now, a lot of us in iSong have written NCLEX test questions, and I, if many of you probably have too, and if you haven't, it's a great experience. It's really where I learned how to write exam questions. Um, and so even though they don't, when you go to one of the item writing sessions, they divide you up into sort of adult health, PED, psych. Um, they don't divide you up according to genetics, but I always try to make all my questions about genetics. So, but of course, I have no idea if they ever get in the licensure exam or not. I can ask my students, and you don't, you know, when you ask them what 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 they saw on the test, you don't necessarily get very valid data. They always tell you the things that are probably the test items. They always come back and say, "Oh, it was all on disaster planning." I'm like, "Well, if you had 15 questions on disaster planning, chances are they were testing out those questions anyway." But anyway, you all have the same issues that I do with the. Um, the NCLEX. So um, I think Kathy and I need to get together because she said there was, this appears 16 times, but maybe I'm more optimistic than you. I, when I did my word check of the number of times the word genetics or genomics turns up in uh, the AAC and essentials, I came up with 18, but I will go back and check. Anyway, we're, um, well, I use the, the thing in the PDF where you can search. So, you know, we're all pretty proud of that, and uh, a lot of us worked very hard, some harder than others, going to all those meetings that you had, Kathy, to around the country to get feedback from people. And I think um, it's pretty amazing how, how much genetics is in there. And I'm, I'm actually really proud of that. So I think I'm not sure that the using the, um, t the genetics concepts in the essentials is maybe a good way to format a survey, but take a look at it and see if you think that the, the, that would provide guidance for you on the things you want to survey your faculty about in terms of assessing your um, utilization or incorporation of genetics. Oh, I just put an example of um, on page 31, uh, and I won't read this to you, but it's an example of the genetic and genomic content in the revised baccalaureate essentials. I never did a count of how many times it appeared in the old essentials. Does anyone know that? Not many. Yeah. Of course, you know, they're only done every 10 years or so, so. Yep. Right, so every 10 years, and you know, but I guarantee 10 years from now we won't be taking out any of the genetics content or words or concepts that are in there. There are also some other um, <coughs> professional nursing standards that you could look at, and I haven't mentioned those here. I probably should have, and one is the um, ISONG scope and standards of genetics clinical nursing, um, um, and also the niche peg competencies you could use. Um, I don't know if we're going to talk about the ISON competencies or not, but I, I'm, if it was me, I'm going to go with the genetic and genomic co competencies second edition if I'm going to be um, evaluating my curriculum again. So, well, of course, we're evaluating our curriculum because we all know it's an ongoing process, but every now and then something stimulates you to push it a little more, you know, not just go to the meetings and make random changes. So we're undergoing right now a structured curriculum review, and it's, um, it's timely because the essentials just came out and the um, CCNE standards changed, and we just had a successful visit, so we can sort of sit back for a few years before we have to write our five-year um, report and really think about our undergraduate curriculum. And the, the problem that I'm having that I know you all have is the multiple competing demands, okay? Because the essentials are really strong in genetics, but they are also really strong on other things that we need to beef up in our curriculum, cultural competencies, gerontology, informatics, evidence-based practice, the QSEN stuff. It's, so how do you do that all? Um, you're all shaking your heads. And I don't have the answer to that, but we're trying. So what we've done is we started our curriculum revision last January. We've been meeting, um, Professor Sandy Mott is spearheading this with me, luckily. That's great for me. Um, she has a lot of experience with this kind of thing, and she's also a, a, a faculty champion for genetics, so that's good. But we met monthly January to June, and we first thing we did was set our goals, identified our strengths, and then we looked at, we all got binders of all these professional guidelines, a lot of guidance from the AACN regarding cultural competency, genetics, everything. Um, I'm almost done revising our program objectives, and that's, that's a big place to start when you're doing curriculum revision. I don't think that the word genetics uh, appears in our undergraduate program objectives, but the concepts that would allow them to fit in under the course objectives or level objectives if you have them really works. 
Um, now we're convening subgroups because we've sort of done the basic work and now we have to say, all right, so s we just sent some people to the AAC and gerontology um, conference, so those people are going to look at throughout the curriculum, where do we teach care of the older adult? We don't have a standalone gerontology course, but we have many courses that it fits in. Same deal with genetics. We've never gone down the route of a standalone course. It's my personal philosophy and the philosophy of the others at my school that a standalone course would be fabulous, granted. But something about having a standalone course in a school of nursing makes people, makes the faculty teaching the specialties feel like well, you got that in your genetics course. I don't know if that's really true. That's just my impression. And rather than really um, beefing it up everywhere, which is what we want to do, it's got to be in pediatrics. It's got to be in psych psychiatric nursing. It, of course, has to be in adult health. I think a lot of us around the table grew up in the era where we learned genetics. Anything I ever learned about genetics was in um, OB or PD. And um, that's not where it needs to go now. Um, ca all cancer is genetic. We, we have to get that message across. All cancer is nothing more than a, a mutated cell. It's a genetic mutation. Um, Alzheimer's disease, there's a lot of genetic implications of that or, or correlates of that. Cardiovascular disease, age-related macular degeneration, diabetes type 1, type 2, all of the really um, important and uh, prevalent causes of morbidity and mortality in adults in this country and elsewhere have a genetic basis. So we have to stop conceptualizing it as a pediatric entity. And you know, our students are fine with that. Honestly, it's sort of embarrassing what our students come to us knowing. If you look through a high school, a high school biology book lately, um, I know this because of my own kids, um, it's stunning what they learn. And so don't let them get away with saying you have to go through teaching them what a Punnett square is because they know what it is. We're the ones that got to get up to speed on it because we didn't have it in high school or college. Um, and so, but that doesn't absolve us from the responsibility of um, being state of the science. <laughs> So I know the whole afternoon is about ways to achieve um, integration of genetics and genom genomics into BS curricula, but I, I can't help but use the podium to give a few of my um, experiences. I'll go through this quickly because we have a whole afternoon on it. But you know, you want to get a key group together if you can, even if it's two people. That's po more powerful than one. You know if you go back and you're a single person with a voice, it's going to be a little harder than if you can form a committee. Because you can always say, well, the committee decided. That's what I do all the time. It's me and another person. but. <laughs> I, I do that with students all the time because they, they buy it. <laughs> um, and then perform a survey if you want to. And another thing that helped us a lot was just to, you know how you all have faculty development programs, even if it's an hour a year. Get somebody in who can do some, some what, what we did is we got a genetic counselor from Brandeis University that I happen to know to come in and talk about genetics in the adult and genetic diseases in the common adult onset diseases. Forget you know, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, people get that. Okay, we've known about that for a long time. We might not have known the exact gene, but we knew about, you know, the Mendelian genetics. So get them to talk about cancer genetics, get them to talk about neuro, get them to talk about psych. Those are harder to talk about because we don't have defined answers. I can't tell you, oh, it's, you know, it's this valine to glutamate substitution that's causing Alzheimer's disease, but you'd be surprised what we really do know. And, and we got to stop being afraid of what we don't know. We made a genetics bulletin board. I actually just had a work study student update our genetics bulletin board. It's easy, it's an easy thing to do, and uh, the student got a lot out of it. And then send key people to meetings and trainings like you're doing now, and there's a lot of them available. You're going to hear about some of those this afternoon. Um, use your uh, pro professional nursing standards as a guideline. Um, and there's so many resources out there that you're going to hear about this afternoon. Don't think you have to write these resources. Go steal the slides. I do it all the time. I don't have, I teach pathophysiology in our grad program and my whole slide presentation on genetics was lifted from somewhere. Um, and it's, it's out there. They want you to use it. Also, like I mentioned, make sure you know what is taught in the basic science and have some expectation uh, that the students are going to build on that, not start over. You know, we start over talking about autosomal dominant in four courses, and we found out we were doing that. We have to stop doing that. We have to, it's part of the vernacular, so we have to make it there. And finally, um, you know, get rid of the fear factor. Um, 
any mm -hmm. of these experts in the room would tell you that they don't feel like experts because honestly the big thing about education as many of you know from your doctoral programs or master's programs is the more you know the more you th the more you know you don't know and it, you know that's one thing I've really learned through my education is how much information there is out there and how I really don't know that much of it but that doesn't remove my passion for learning it and um, you know my reality about what what I can achieve and I and I, I can't be an expert but you know I know more of my students <laughs> so thank you from the city of Boston we finally finished our big dig um, still not any better driving but <laughs> Um, I'm going to be around all day so I can take questions now or I think we have time, plenty of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you. I, I missed this morning when you were introducing yourself, so if you don't have any questions, I'd be interested in hearing what your challenges or, and or solutions have been. Yeah. I actually have a quick question. Um, it sounds like we all need to go back and do a survey. That would be one of the first things, right? Good. Um, is there a pre-made survey that we could steal? All I did was take the, the niche peg competencies and put them on a page or on SurveyMonkey and said please state which of the following are covered in your curriculum um, somewhat or not a lot somewhat or not okay. at all it was that simple okay um, I don't know of anybody else that's done a survey like that I haven't seen one recently at least with nursing but and we um, did a national survey, a couple national surveys, and so, um, but they're pretty detailed. But I'm certainly willing to give those, you know, to you, and you can take them apart or do what you want. But I really like Kathy's idea of just taking um, the essentials and, and kind of asking about from that perspective. ask a question about the survey real quick um, did you have the individual faculty list the courses in which they taught so if they taught several courses they actually listed the number I actually distributed the, the um, survey by course so I went through my course list wrote down who teaches it and and so there were a couple of faculty that filled out two surveys but I went by course not by faculty name so you're all pre CCNE reporting right now is that what that's why you're here what are the other areas besides genetics that are causing you tension geriatric. yeah yeah Ger geriatric and there's so much genetics related to that too uh, the Nash the national safety goals are part of that and geriatrics but I think faculty are more comfortable in those areas than the genetics content. And that's where the problem comes. <clears throat> so I, I just, I teach pathophysiology. I don't consider myself even a quarter of an expert, but, but I probably have a better handle on it than a lot of my faculty do. And I just think the word genetics just sends a bolt of fear up them. I always say that so. genetics is the new organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And there are resources out there, and we will talk about some of those mm -hmm. um, in the afternoon. And so that can help with that. It won't solve the problems, but there, you know, can help. Right. And of course, my area has always been med surge. So for me to help the OB or the farm person, or you know, although the mental health. You know, I, I can't specifically do that for them. So It's always been interesting to me, though, how the concepts apply everywhere. And I, I like you teach pathophysiology in a grad program, and I have one class on genetics. But, you know, the class has every specialty from nurse anesthesia to master's entry students who aren't nurses. It's crazy. But, you know, the basic concepts, the Mendelian concepts, 
apply even in the adult onset disorders and in cancer. I think there again, though, the Mendelian, they're, they're more, the students come to our program with a better handle on that than all this multifactorial genomics stuff, you know, and so that's where their eyes are opened. And that's where I think we need to focus even more than the Mendelian. Is, is someone, in fact, going to talk about the Surgeon General's uh, health history? I mention it, and I do highlight it. Um, I don't go through it, um, but you'll see the website, and um, I will talk about how it can be used in the curriculum. But um, it is it could be a really valuable teaching tool as well, not just in your theory classes or didactic classes, but in the clinical arena. And we ask our students to do a three-generation pedigree, pedigree of their own family using that site. And um, I always say, look, nurses have been doing genetics, doing genetic nursing forever because we've always taken a, a, a health history. But we have to start looking more seriously at those adult onset disorders in there instead of just asking you about the things we think of as, you know, childhood onset because that's where the information comes from. And any good clinician will tell you that, that, that you start, like your compelling story. It's all about the family history. And you're already teaching your students what to do when there's a family history. Maybe not doing the pedigrees, but um, Jeannie and I were talking about this last night. Um, when I get a family um, history for a family where there's a child with a cleft lip and palate, I might get a very strong family history of diabetes. And so what do I start talking about? Not the cleft lip and palate, but, you know, are you getting glucose testing? You know, are, is your um, family physician aware of this? Are your family nurse practitioner aware of this? Or, you know, and, um, or with cardiovascular disease, you know, getting blood pressure checks and think about this for your kids and you know, cholesterol checks. I mean, so it's just really um, giving you another tool to look at it more comprehensively. Um, they don't have to sit down and talk about the inheritance patterns, mm -hmm. um, but um, if you saw a family history like that, would you, you know, you know, first refer back to whoever their pediatrician or family um, physician or nurse practitioner is, but you talk about specialties as well. Um, wouldn't necessarily be a genetics referral, but who's going to manage that care? So. Um, that stuff's already being done, you know, that's, that's kind of discussion. You know, I think one of the, the main things is, and you brought this up several times, is that fear of the unknown. Um, you know, I think for myself even uh, in teaching med surge, um, that not being, an, I feel like I don't have enough information to, you know, follow up on their questions. and I. And I think that for other faculty, that's kind of the same thing. So it's that not being so afraid of not necessarily knowing and helping them to figure out where the resources are. And, you know, I got to tell you, the world has changed in a couple of years. I can stand in my class with my laptop and a student asks me a question, I can just Google it right there and get a pretty darn good website with the answer. And that's the way they see this. They see that I don't know anything. I mean, the students are intimidated by a professor that they think knows everything, so you can't let them think that's true. But if you can help them figure out, okay, how am I going to find this out? And then you can say, well, what is this Google site? Okay, it's NIH. Yeah, I'll look at it, you know. But it's, it's such a, that's why we're all in these jobs we do, because it's nursing and education. It's just so stimulating, because it's not boring. I taught anatomy for a couple of years. I gave that up. <laughs> that hasn't changed in 100,000 years. So. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that I, um, because I, I lecture on genetics and I feel like I don't know anything about genetics, um, so I, the, my first lecture, um, I, I thought, well, let me just, you know, hey, ha raise your hand if you remember fifth grade genetics. And of course, everybody did this. And, um, and then, but we started talking about it, so it sort of became a discussion lecture as opposed to, because they, everybody knows a little bit, 
So that, that was just a thought. And the problem that I have, and you, you probably experienced this too, is I just, I just taught my genetics le lecture in my patho class last week, and it, it, I, I had to stay 45 minutes after class because of the line. It was all people, one woman has five children with severe disabilities. Do I think they could be related? Could that be fragile X? Could that be mitochondrial disease? And I'm, I'm not a clinician right now. You know, you got to go see your, your person. But everybody's got a family, and everybody's got a family history. And, you know, you see the wheels spinning in the class. So that's great. The more interactive you can make the class, it's, it, it really works. Yeah. Get you in bad situations too. Look, the questions you didn't know the answers. So, it's like we can't let them sit over there. <laughs> that we don't know the answers to the questions that come up either. <laughs> but we have students in the classroom with their laptops on, and so that's an opportunity for them to Google and get to mm -hmm. what are these websites, and is the NIH the one you want, or is yeah. it the guy, you know, with a website out of his garage yeah. <laughs> where it has a particular issue that is... Uh, or trying to sell you a test. Try, yeah. Trying yeah. to uh, promote. Them. So so that, I think that's that. what you, <laughs> I've been hearing is that, yeah, there are a lot of things none of us knows, but... That's not the point. The point is making that link to what does it do, what does it matter to people and the way that we take care of people. And, and that, that's something that we can all, I think, identify with pretty clearly. Judy, can you give me a second? <laughs> sure. Thank you. I just had a thought because Dr. Guttmacher had also mentioned this morning that this is a lifelong process. None of us can remain experts right now because it's evolving at such a r rapid rate. And so if we identify the mechanisms for that continued learning, not only for us, but for our students and the clinical practitioners, I think we'll be much further ahead as the EHRs and the decision-making tools become available to our, our practitioners of the future. Judy? Yeah, I'm right here now. Oh, where are you? That sort of builds on exactly what I was going to say. Uh, I think of some of my faculty colleagues like they have to know this they have to know that they have to know this they have to know that if you come to the realization that everything you teach them is no longer true by the time they graduate which is really true i mean i work in computers and i work in infertility and i work in genetics and those are three fields that you know geez you still we're not using dos anymore um, and so uh, if you realize that and you realize that the only thing that you teach them of value 